slides, hopefully. Yeah, so this is the um, LinkML, uh, the Link Data Modeling Framework tutorial at ISMB uh, in July 2024. You can find these slides, and I would definitely suggest that you do find these slides at that bit.ly link, or if you want to scan the QR code, that would be great too. Um, there's a lot of links in these slides and a lot of different like Git commands that you might want to just copy and paste as we're going through this. Um, and so, you know, if, if you can get into these slides, it's a good resource. <clears throat> we do have a, a link ML drive for this, this workshop. Uh, there'll be, you know, anything that we generate here will be in that drive and you should have access to it. Of course, these slides, um, what we're going to try to do today is just walk through making a new LinkML schema project. And that will involve learning some of the basics of the modeling language itself and understanding how to validate data according to a schema, as well as sort of lint or, you know, make sure you're following the best practices of your schema, how you're developing that. And then look at some of the features that LinkML offers in terms of code and documentation generation. Uh, via a few command line tools. And then hopefully by the end, we'll have you all set up on GitHub with a deployment of our of our tutorial to your own GitHub Pages account. We'll, we'll cross our fingers and hope we can get there. <laughs> I think we can. Um, since it's such a small group of us, of course, just ask that. If you have any questions, we'll stop. It's okay to interrupt any of us. Um, we also have this Google Doc for questions and answers in case you know your your question is is more in depth than we have time to go through. We'll also have a person, Mark. Um, he's here on the right, monitoring that Google Doc, answering when he can. Um, you know, converting that Google Doc into a FAQ for our for our tool. So it's a nice place to add longer questions if you have them. Uh, my name is Sierra. As I said, I'm a, a longtime software developer. Uh, my two colleagues, Patrick and Kevin, are also longtime software developers. We've been working to support science um, as software developers for many years now uh, through a variety of different projects. We all are LinkML developers, but each of us has more of a focus on one part of the toolkit than others. Um, and so we'll try to keep to the answering questions to the, the expertise that we have. Um, we have a large online community for LinkML, a lot of open source developers. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, a Slack channel and uh, you know a Google group and and all sorts of stuff that's pretty active. So if you have interest in joining us, we'd love to have you. Um, and you know I can invite you to more of these kinds of meetings where we do tutorials and hear from the community uh, once a month. But just a big thank you to all the people that have put time and effort into LinkML in really a non-funded open source way. And we hope that some of you will join us as well after this. Um, just just as a matter of course, we try to follow code and conduct at LinkML. We are welcoming. We use inclusive language. We're you know respectful of different viewpoints and definitely accept constructive criticism. We love feedback and we love to make our tool better. Um, and so, uh, just pointing out the code of conduct and hoping that everyone else can can, can abide by that in this tutorial as well. <clears throat> so this is what our schedule looks like. I'll give a brief introduction to the toolkit and framework. We'll set up a LinkML repository. Hopefully, everyone can follow along. Uh, we'll walk through some of the very common LinkML model components and show you how they're used and how to how to write metadata for your schema. We'll have a little break. Continue with some more modeling, uh, talking about um, ontology integration with enumerations and mapping to other models that exist in the world. Um, go through uh, a, a tutorial on how to lint your schema, including you know, following best practices that we found over the last couple of years of, of real, you know, testing the tires of this framework. We've, we've come to some conclusions about what we think are best practices for offering a schema, even though LinkML is very permissive when it comes to syntax. And then we will um, show you how to generate code from your model, whether that be JSON schema or Pydantic or even our full documentation site. Have another break validate some test data that we put together, and then, you know, of course, wrap up, answer any questions, et cetera. We, um, we did send out a few prerequisites for this tutorial, it, it, especially if you want to follow along. These things are nice to have, you know, GitHub account where we can deploy your documentation, uh, Python 3.9 or higher. LinkML is, is, is grounded in Python, right? So we, all of our tools are developed in Python. That's 
that's our language of choice, and then PipX for helping to solve the never ending challenges of making a Python environment. It will help here. And another slide you'll see often throughout the day are these rest stops. We hope you follow along with us and we build up our project. We hope you can do that on your own command line. But you know, if you get lost or we're going too fast, which is definitely my, my challenge here, um, you can always clone our repo and we have tags in that repo that you can check out. So after I after Patrick talks about, you know, how to create a project with our cookie cutter, if you, you know, get behind, you can always check out the tag that he's created that is the result of the entirety of that section. So they're all linked here again with those slides. I can put up the, the link in the chat. I'll put up the link in the chat to these slides as well um, as we go. So I think to, Anybody have any questions to start? Hi, David. Nice to see you. <laughs> Should we be starting from uh, Git cloning that repo or from a bare repo? Or will that come later? I think you should just start with just a command line. And we'll right. try to get you through walking through the cookie cutter so you don't have to clone this. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and let me put in the chat really quick a link to these slides. <clears throat> and again, those are those have lots of links in them. OK, so I'm Sierra. We sort of said that already. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to LinkML. And I think a lot of people on the call already know that that we're, we're in a field where our data is really complex. We don't have simple data that doesn't change very often. In fact, you know, whether you're looking at a cell like this in the beginning, in the middle of the slide here, where you're talking about the functions of a gene or, or its relation to other genes within a particular cellular structure, to you know, higher level biology, comparing genetic effects on different organisms, to even higher biology, maybe uh, is one way to say it. You know, clinical um, models of, of of patient care, or even in the environment itself. Right, you're you're looking at data that is quite complex, has lots of different components. It's never shaped like a cube here, and it and it, unfortunately, it's it's most of our knowledge is still in in text formats, in papers in spreadsheets, in other ways, that, in other uh, formats that aren't computable. And so, you know, what we often see from our data is that we get really incomplete metadata along with our data sets. We might have, you know, a, a, a decreased use of global identifiers. They're, they're not consistent. They have no sort of like longevity. We might not have standardized variables in the headers of our spreadsheets. We have a lot of free text information. And sometimes we have these wide sparse tables with hundreds of variables. Um, that may or may not be null on purpose, right? We can never tell if null is because somebody forgot to fill in a component or if it's validly null because we're talking about a particular kind of sample or a particular kind of data or whether it's just, um, you know, null because something else is, is complete. <clears throat> and this is actually a depth field from one of the projects we work on. Uh, we, uh, the National Microbiome Data Collaborative is a group that is trying to sort of synchronize and harmonize metadata around microbiome data collection in the biological sciences. And you know, they'll they'll have sample data come in with depth fields, a depth column that has all these different kinds of, of values in it. And it's our job to sort of harmonize that. And I think this is pretty common. Everyone who works in biological data knows this. And so I mean we can do better, right? We can we can have two different pathways to make this better. One, we can start with shared standards. Uh, and reuse and contribute to those efforts when possible. Like we should not be recreating the wheel for a lot of these different kinds of standards and models and vocabularies and definitions of our of our objects. We should try to use ones that already exist and contribute to it when our expertise uh, uh, dictates that. Make make the, the the source better. And then the other thing we can do, the other half of that, is to take these sort of implicit models or what I'm calling implicit models, where someone has an idea of what the data is when they're collecting it and translate those into explicit models where we can actually see from the data itself in a computable way how to how to, how to to take that data and reuse it. And I, again, I sort of introduced myself at the beginning. I'm a software developer, I'm not a biologist. And so all of these examples, you please give me a little grace. They're just me coming up with things on the fly here. But I think the best way to notice, to, to sort of examine this space is to really look at it. some examples. And these are three example data sets from Oregon, this is the state I live in in the United States. One is from uh, Lake Albert, one is from the Pacific Ocean, and one is from Crater Lake. And there's some sneaky stuff with these different biomes in Oregon. Uh, one I'll tell you is that uh, Lake Albert is actually a saltwater uh, inland lake, 
and Crater Lake is a freshwater lake. It's actually the, the deepest lake in Oregon. And of course, the Pacific Ocean is the Pacific Ocean. And so if I had these three independent researchers trying to find out about the microbiome composition of, of these different bodies of water in Oregon, that's great. They might collect it all in different ways. And we might have a fourth researcher come along and really want to look at that epipelagic region of the sample data sets. Like you might really want to see just where the sunlight penetrates these water samples. And what, <clears throat> what they have when they come along is, is really a, a diversity of data to work with. And, and so the first thing that that researcher might have to do is pull out from these titles of our sample data sets, the actual type of sample that that they're looking at so that they can compare across the data sample types. And so one of the things we think about when we're aggregators is like, how do I define whether or not something is a lake or an ocean? And is my definition of a lake the same as your definition of a lake? Can a puddle be a lake? Can a, you know, can a, a ephemeral pool be a lake? Does a lake have to have a certain size? Is it freshwater? Is it saltwater? And all of those things that we're thinking about aren't necessarily something that we're thinking about from from scratch, right? A lot of people think about these things. A lot of people combine their knowledge to make ontologies, right? To make controlled vocabulary data sets that are hierarchically related that define these different concepts. And so in fact, like our researchers, if 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 they were aware of these, could know that the the ENVO, the environmental ontology, does define what a lake is. It tells in in specifically whether or not that lake is, you know, a marine water body, a saltwater body. Uh, you know, a non-saltwater body, it defines the shape and size of lakes. So we could reuse those definitions taken from people who know about lakes, the experts, and really annotate our data with a controlled vocabulary of identifiers that stick around forever, that have, um, you know, reusable definitions, and that uh, allow us to interoperate with other data sets also using those ontologies. So a, a very easy thing to add here is just an annotation of the type of our sample with an ontology term. And in fact, we see that, you know, marine photic zone, the epipelagic layer is actually recorded in the ontology as well. So we could see even more specifically than whether or not it was saltwater or freshwater, we could see that it's also at the top of a, of a water column. <clears throat> and in fact, our colleagues at the National Microbiome Data Collaborative have done just this. They annotate a lot of their data with ENVO, the environment ontology, but also bring in together um, a couple of other standards, the MIXS, Minimal Information About a Sequence standard, and the Gold Ecosystem Classification. So we have a lot of interoperability and reuse going on with just these ontology annotations in our metadata. I can compare a heck of a lot of data already. For example, in other domains, you know, the human phenotype ontology, for example, uses the chemical and biological entity ontology, or KEBI, and the cell ontology as well. So we can combine these standards together and really really do a good job of annotating our data with ontologies, but but that's maybe not enough, right? So we, we've, we've tagged our data in this example with a particular environment ontology term, but unfortunately we still have to harmonize, excuse me, the rest of these fields in this implicit data set. We should really be looking at depth here and trying to do a better job of making this computable. <clears throat> really, these are models, these are schemas hiding in plain sight, right? And <clears throat> the only way we can compute over them or compare them or aggregate them is with a human getting involved. Um, and in fact, not only is it just, you know, it's not really just that we're in a spreadsheet and people can enter, you know, data in a non-clean way in a spreadsheet or whatever, there's not a lot of uh, validation in a spreadsheet, but it's not just that, right? We can have really um, uh, stable, existing frameworks like SQL for making our data models here. And, and still we'll have the same problem of not being able to interoperate. In this example, I have a, you know, a, a sample table with an environment and it has a var car here. So I'm saying, well, this must be a string value. And over here in this other sample, the Crater Lake sample, I'm giving an idea of where the environment is actually a foreign key. You can imagine this sample might have a relationship to an ontology term table or something while this one is just collecting strings. And, and if you think I'm just making it up, it's, it's I'm totally not, right? This is the Alliance of Genome Resources where four or five different model organism databases are trying to come together and make a single schema for their data. And this is, you know, each of them trying to describe uh, with SQL the definition of a genotype. And you can tell right away that they're just, they're not the same. And we have to, even though the, they're conceptually the same, they're not computably the same. 
And so, yeah, go ahead. so uh, um, I missed the beginning because I, ha I had a hard time to connect. Uh, with the uh, are we uh, expected to, to wait at certain times to ask questions, or can we can throw them in as we go? Oh no, please! You did you did great. Like just just interrupt at any time. That's totally fine. And if we need to move on, I will certainly move us along. But yes, please ask questions whenever you'd like. Okay, thanks. So, so like. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering why, why you're showing this example of uh, like SQL tables. Basically, we're, we're like, like, I guess it doesn't really matter whether the Pacific Ocean sample, uh, the Pacific Ocean group versus the Crater Lake group store their data in one way or another. Where, where what, what really matters is the way that they're going to build these interoperable objects to exchange information, right? Definitely. And I mean, good point. Like people can store their data however they want. My point with this slide is really to say that sometimes when you when you see data being presented to you as an as a as a researcher in the biological space, what you get is maybe a schema definition. You might get the Pacific Ocean sample schema and you might get the Crater Lake sample data in SQL. You might get it through schema view or something like that. And it's still on you as the researcher that wants to combine these to figure out what someone means by environment here versus environment there. So if I want to bring this together, I still am not interoperable, even though they're both in the same technological language, even though they're both SQL, even though I can use the same tools on that SQL database, I can't, there's still a human involved to harmonize that data. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, all right. So what we think is that LinkML helps us solve this and we'll, We'll we'll get into it, but but LinkML in is it is a two part toolkit and framework. One, it has a meta model that defines the elements and the metadata components that you can use to annotate a schema using LinkML. And on the other side of the framework or toolkit are a set of tools that you can use once your data or once your schema is in LinkML to do a lot of interesting things like validate your data convert your data between different forms. Say I got it in JSON and I want it in TSV or I got it in TSV and I want it in JSON. Also, maybe there, there are tools that you can do data entry with. So we have a tool called Data Harmonizer that takes a LinkML model under the hood and it spins up sort of like a online user interface that is makes the, the data entry conformant with a schema. We can also do inference on our data and we can generate code from our models. So LinkML has the meta model and the toolkit. And what we're going to see today is how you take some of these implicit models and turn them using the LinkML syntax into a computable model that builds in RDF and semantic web technologies under the hood in a simple way that doesn't make everyone learn how to do OWL, although we very much <laughs> encourage people to do OWL and learn Sparkle and all, all those great tools that, that exist for the semantic web. Uh, LinkML has a lot of features in it that maybe some of these other more standard modeling languages don't. You can import a LinkML model from another LinkML model. So if I want to reuse your little tiny component model, I can do that with a simple import. I can specify classes more specifically um, in a hierarchy, and I'll, and I'll show you all of this. There's some nice links here to an online tutorial as well, um, and of course, documentation. The other good, nice point, po part of LinkML is that you can use it as a converter box. So if you have a complicated application, right, and you might have a, a SQL database in the background and you might have um, an API that sits in the middle and at the end you might have some JavaScript or TypeScript or something that displays a web page, you can actually use LinkML in all of those different technical stacks uh, using a converter. So I can take my LinkML model and make it into SQL data definition language. I can make it into, you know, a Pydantic uh, data class representation to use with a fast API implementation, and I can generate TypeScript from my model as well. So it kind of helps you keep that um, language that you're using throughout your organization the same. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more about the validators. I won't go into this in too much depth, but you can use a LinkML schema to validate your data, and you can <clears throat> generate um, LinkML from existing models. So you could take uh, a JSON schema model, run it through our converters, and it would spit out LinkML YAML. I think one of the most underappreciated things about LinkML and underappreciated things in general is that we need to create documentation for our models. We need people to have easy access to what we're talking about. One of the most important things about creating a data model or a standard of any kind is 
is community buy-in, right? We want people to use the same model. We don't want to use lots of different models. And I think what thing LinkML does a great job is generating documentation from annotations on the schema itself. So you keep your documentation close to your code, but you can also display it for a user in a more general way. <clears throat> so done talking. That's sort of the pitch. And now let's see how it works. And I just wanted to remind everybody about the rest stops. So we are on step zero, the basic project creation. And I think I'm going to stop sharing here and hand it over to my colleague, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Sierra. And I will share. OK. So this is this is kind of where the the hands-on part of the um, <coughs> tutorial really really starts. So we hope we'll follow along as we do this. So um, this first part is going to be um, setting up a, a LinkML project. Um, now there are a couple of different ways to author LinkML schemas, and the 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 baseline like the, the yeah way is to just write your write your uh your schema as as yaml um and that's the that's what we're going to do in this tutorial but that's it's not the only way so i'll just point out very quickly that like a couple other options just to keep in the back of your mind you know once you leave this tutorial is that there is a tool called um, Schema Sheets that you takes uh, a spreadsheet format and can generate the uh, the YAML version of the LinkML schema from it. And then Sierra already briefly mentioned, um, but yeah, there's there's there are tools to take what we kind of refer to as semi-structured sources, run it through this schema automator tool, and again, the output is um link ml yaml so the yaml is really like the baseline and that's that's what we're going to stick with throughout this tutorial um but you know like i said there's a few other options out there um and then as far as schema development goes you know we've you know through our time like authoring our own link ml schemas because you know not only do we develop the link ml tools but we you know, we write these schemas ourselves. And so we've kind of developed some best practices over the years. And, and so we've kind of encoded that into um, this uh, project cookie cutter repository. And so that's, that's what's going to help us like bootstrap our project here today. Um, and so it has a lot of this, it has a lot of this good stuff like licensing and, and Git initialization and um, uh, that kind of stuff just set up out of the box for you. Um, and so here's the basic overview of what we're going to do with the cookie cutter um, and, in, and what we're going to do in this section of the of the, the, the tutorial here. First, we got to make sure we have like the right tools installed. This is kind of like a one time uh, setup. And then we're going to create and set up our project. Um, and then just have to talk very briefly about virtual environments. This is a Python thing. So if you're familiar with the world of Python, you might already know about this. If not, this might be new to you, but we just kind of got to, and this is, we could talk all day about Python virtual environments, but we'll just talk very briefly. But if, if for example, you've got a project over here that uses one version of LinkML and like some other dependencies, you've got another one over here, maybe it's using a slightly different version of LinkML, it's got its own dependencies. We need to keep these things like separate and not like interfering with each other. And so that's where virtual environments come into play. We draw a little boundary around these, <laughs> these, these different projects and we call them virtual environments. Um, and so generally each project you work on is going to have its own virtual environment. There's many ways to like make and manage virtual environments in the Python ecosystem. Some might say too many, but <laughs> the tool that the LinkML like development team has kind of embraced is a tool called Poetry. So Poetry is the tool that we're going to use to create and interact with our virtual environments. So you, in throughout the rest of this tutorial, you're going to see a lot of like Poetry run type commands. And so that's what's happening there. It's just it's just a way to interact with a, a Python virtual environment. Um, and um, 
so yeah, so here we go. So this is this is where we're really going to get started now. So first, um, is poetry similar to conduct? Yes, they do kind of solve similar problems. There is overlap anyway between poetry and conduct. Not exactly the same. Um, okay, so first, um, let's uh, see if we've already got poetry. Um, oops. Poetry installed. So I happen to have poetry installed already. Um, if you don't, if you try poetry dash dash version on your command line and you get a command not found, we recommend installing poetry using pipx. Um, pipx is a, a modern sort of Python tool for um, installing Python based command line applications. Uh, so hopefully you already have pipf, pipx installed. <laughs> um, um, that was something we kind of sent out instructions for um, uh, ahead of time. Uh, but if not, um, there are some uh, some nice instructions uh, here at the pipx um, documentation. Um, Okay, yeah. So if you're familiar with Conda, if you if you're if you kind of already know what you're doing with that, you're you're more than welcome to. Um, um, but yeah. Um, so I'll take a, a a pause here and just make sure everybody's caught up. Is everybody hopefully at a place where they now have um, poetry installed? It's installing right now, but so, so I, I have a first question. So like. What we're trying to do now with the uh, section uh, uh, zero from the plan, I think, mm -hmm. is, is, is to um, uh, set up a, a, a GitHub repo that will publish our link ML schema that others will be able to find to understand the way we're organizing the, the data, right? That's right. Yes. That's Thank exactly you. right. Yeah, we're going. We're setting up sort of an, an environment and a a a, a project of. Um, you know, files and folders and all that um, for developing a link ML schema. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to move forward here um, and start talking about Cruft a little bit. So Cruft is another Python based uh, command line tool um, that uh, can be used to um, take a what's her for Joe's a cookie cutter um, a sort of a, a template repository and customize it through some um, you know interactive questions and then you know produce a, a project for you if you've installed if you've used the the cookie cutter package before you you kind of already know what cruft does cruft just adds a little bit more on top of cookie cutter the, the differences aren't if that doesn't make any sense to you that that's fine it, the differences aren't that aren't that interesting or, or relevant here um but the first thing i'm going to do is also check by running cruft help to see if i already have cruft installed and i do um if you don't um cruft is another thing that is um, pipx installable um so the goal here is um by the end of this step, hopefully um, you're able to run cruft dash dash help and uh, see that it is installed. So uh, I, I understand that uh, uh, cruft is like cookie cutter, but uh, I, I missed what, what cookie cutter does. OK, yeah. So um, cookie cutter kind of, you can point it to um, a, uh, a sort of a specially, a specially formatted repository, and Cookie Cutter knows how to sort of um, take the contents of that repository. It'll ask you questions like, "What do you want to name this thing? W like, what's what's your name? You know, it asks you questions, and then based on your answers, kind of plug in like little holes, a little you know, it's like a, the 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 Cookie Cutter itself." provides a kind of a template with some information for you to fill in. So then cookie cutter is taking the contents of that, plugging in your answers, and then kind of spitting out the results onto your onto your file system. Got it. Thank you. 
Sorry, I don't want to slow down things too much for like, I, I, I have another question. So yeah. uh, I, I installed stuff with Pipx um, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it works, they're installed, but yet they're not available from the command line yet. Uh, I mean, I can also install them with ABD get, but like, uh, like, like, like through Pipx, it seems if I, if I, if I don't, uh, if I install it through Pipx, it, it, it's not available. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um... There may be, um, let me look real quick here. Um, you may may try running, um, I'll put it in the chat here. It's a command pipx ensure path. And, um, you if if you also just installed pipx for the first time you may also need to um maybe close and restart your terminal to like resource the your environment okay, yeah, no, the, I, I did that but, uh, okay I'll do it, it, yeah okay uh it says success added whatever folder to the path environment variable so let's see Uh, okay, I'll, I'll I'll continue investigating that as you. <laughs> it doesn't work for me yet. Okay. Um, all right. We'll we'll I'll I can loop back to you um, after after the you know we get through a couple more steps and see yep. see how you're doing that. Um, and the last thing in terms of prerequisites is that the um, our sort of initial project setup is going to involve. Um, making some, making it automated uh, or set, setting up a Git repository um, for our project and also making an, an initial commit um, to that Git repository. And so if you've never like worked with Git on uh, your system before, you might need to do some uh, configuration first. So, um, um, so you might want to just check first if uh, like your e name and email address and, and default branch are set. Um, so I'm gonna, let's see here, git config global user name. Okay, so I have um, configured this. If you've ever worked with a git repository before, you've probably already done this. Um, yep, that's me, all right. <laughs> so, um, but if you haven't, uh, you can, you can use uh, these commands to uh, to configure that. Okay, um, man, moving on. Okay, and so finally, this is uh, where we're going to start setting up our project. So we'll start from the directory where we want our new project directory to to live. Um, so I'm in a little bit of a. Um, I'm in. I'm in, so I'm in my work, a work directory here. And so um, this command is going to uh, create a new project directory within this one. Um, and the command is here. So cruft create, and then the, the URL of the, uh, the cookie cutter repository. So when I run that, here's where it's going to start asking me some questions. So um, for, uh, let's see, project name, I want to use link, oops, link ML tutorial 2024. Um, GitHub or, I don't know why it's phrased like, <laughs> like this to be honest github a username or organization um so i'm going to use my 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 work one here um a project description uh ismb 2024 um full name email address and then uh, 
the last few are uh, the, these first five are kind of like the most important ones. The, the last the last ones you can kind of uh, flip through kind of quickly. It's asking about a license. We'll just accept the first one. It's going to generate um, some an initial like very basic, almost like kind of like a hello world like model uh, using this uh, person class. That's that's fine. We're gonna we're we're gonna you know clobber that later. But for now, we'll just accept it. Do you want to create Python classes? Yes, that's fine. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that there's a way to create a link ML model based on spreadsheets and it's asking if I want to use that. The default is no, so I'm going to accept that. I, it, I don't, even though I already said no, it always still asks like, what's your sheet ID? So just accept that it's not going to be used for anything. Same with this Google Sheet tabs thing. And then um, uh, this is a bit of customization around how your uh, documentation gets deployed on GitHub pages. Again, the, just accepting the default is, is fine. Okay, so it's taken all of my answers and it has made this link ML tutorial 2024 directory. Um, and so I can CD into that directory. Well, it's made all this nice, these nice files for me. For instance, you know, what did I say? I said I wanted an MIT license. So if I. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, okay, back to the slides here. So yeah, so again, here's the command if you need to copy and paste that. And then the last thing to do is run this make setup command. Um, what this is gonna do is this is actually going to set up the virtual environment, install all the dependencies, it's going to do a basic art like generation of some artifacts from your schema, including documentation. And then the last thing it's going to do is um, initialize uh, uh, or do the first commit to a Git, the Git repository. So the last thing to do is make setup. So you can see it made a did get a knit on this thing. Now it's doing a uh, poetry install, installing a bunch of dependencies. And the last thing it did was it made a, a commit, an initial commit with all of the, uh, uh, with all the files that were generated from uh, the cookie cutter. Um, okay, I'll pause here. Um, are people kind of following along? Any other, uh, any questions or anything? Okay, we'll keep going then. So the last thing, um, the last thing I want to do is, I'm going to put this on, on GitHub. Um, you don't have to do this, uh, you know, but it's, um, you know, if you have a GitHub account, if you want to, you know, push your repository up, this will help with the later on when we see things about like generating and publishing documentation. So, um, I'm going to go to, uh, uh, github.com slash new, um, I'm going to say uh, link ML tutorial 2024 for the repository name. Um, we can work locally now. Yeah, you absolutely. Yes, you definitely can. Um, public repository. I don't want to add anything to it. I just want a bare repository. Okay. And then since we already have uh, an existing local repository, I just need to uh, run these commands here. So I'm adding uh, this as a remote uh, named origin to this repository. Um, my branch is already named main, so I don't need to do that. That's just making sure that the branch name on GitHub and locally are the, are the same, but I, I already know that's that's true for me. And the last thing is to push 
Push my repository up. Okay, and then if I refresh this page, okay, great. There's all my there's all my files. It's actually already running a GitHub action, which we'll kind of talk about later. Um, and so there it is. That's our find my slides again. That's it. That's it for setting up a project. Um, the next section, Sierra, will talk about a little bit more about like what <laughs> what the heck is actually in there and what you can do with it. Um, but if you followed along with that so far, uh, you should be you should be in a pretty good place. Um, is there any specific questions before I move on? According to, according, uh, we're actually ahead of schedule. I, I just ran. We have like five. We have five minutes, so I don't want to move on like too fast. So I'm, I'm happy to. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. Still running. Makes up perfect. Okay. So yeah. Um, I'm happy to just be quiet and answer questions, and we'll give like five minutes for people to kind of catch up. I know there was um, there's that one extra batch in this GitHub repo, heading the GitHub pages um, branch to the pull documentation to. Do you want to wait to do that later, or do you want to just click this button? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can show that. OK, there is. So I guess this wasn't, um, um, yeah, we didn't put this in the slides. But um, eventually, when we want to publish our schema's documentation to get up pages, we have to do one bit of extra setup in, in GitHub, which is to say in settings, come down to pages here, and say that uh, we want to deploy from uh, uh, from this branch called gh um, which i believe makes that up did that for us i believe yeah right okay uh so that branch should already exist um after the after our initial um, push to github so uh, you select github pages as the branch to deploy to and hit save um, so that's that's one little bit that's not not perhaps not automatable, I guess. Yeah, probably not automatable. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to get stuck and you needed to clone our tutorial repo, that's the command to do it. You can just copy and paste and you should get a repository locally that looks an awful lot like like uh, Patrick's demonstration that's right yeah that's right but again we hope we hope we hope yeah. you're following along <laughs> okay oh, rob got it great yes. fantastic i feel like we needed to hand out prizes getting through the <laughs> environments is like the worst the worst set of slides here <laughs> no tutorial is complete without a slightly painful setup procedure <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so maybe I will try to take over the share now, or are we still? Go ahead and hit stop okay. on, on my end. All right, we're back at it. All right, so just to, to keep us going here, we're going to actually start writing some LinkML YAML now. We're going to develop a model. To set the state again, we're going to use our Example that I introduced in the introduction. It's a made up example. Bear with us. But this is our implicit data model, and we're going to try to turn that into LinkML. And I think one thing that helps people learn LinkML meta model syntax, which is the section that we're going to be learning about now, it's helpful to see how LinkML syntax compares to some other popular modeling frameworks. So if you're familiar with, for example, JSON schema, a LinkML class is equivalent to um, you know, a JSON schema object. A link ML slot is equivalent to, uh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. 
adjacent schema uh, property, right? If you're familiar with SQL, a, a link ML class is equivalent to a table, a slot is equivalent to a column, and so on. So honestly, when, when I'm learning meta, the meta model syntax, <clears throat> I definitely lean on some of the existing knowledge I have about different modeling syntax to understand the, the syntax of link ML meta model. However, you know, you can always go to this link, which I probably, is it going to share? Oh, how wonderful. Yay, Juno. <clears throat> so um, you can actually go to our documentation and it describes the meta model. One of the interesting things about LinkML is that LinkML is a link, LinkML modeling, meta model language is a LinkML schema. So we're kind of like eating our own dog food. I think that's what it's called. Um, and it's all documented through an automatic deploy system, just the way you know, we're going to do for our particular model. So you can go there and read a little bit about it in addition. So I'm going to use PyCharm. That's my editor of choice, Python developer. So it's easy for me. You can use any editor of choice you want, even if you just have the command line. Of course, you can use something like Nano, you know, something just to edit this file. Um, when when you've completed the, the setup using the cookie cutter, it's going to give you a directory structure that looks something like this. You're going to have some GitHub actions that are going to be able to run for you you're going to have this project directory, which we'll get to towards the end of the tutorial. And then you're going to have your source. And in your source is where the YAML, the LinkML model YAML eventually resides. And you also have the, a data directory where you can put sample data, which is important if you want to run tests against your schema to make sure that any schema changes is accurately reflected in example data. Um, but we're going to edit this particular file and I'm going to stop sharing this and we'll start sharing <clears throat> just give me a minute we'll wait for Juno to catch up with me <clears throat> Patrick is lucky he has two screens I have one screen and so ah, it's telling me to wait <laughs> of course it didn't happen during the demo try again All right, there we go. So you sh 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 should be seeing my pie charm. Yes. All right. All right. So when you get a new project generated with LinkML, it comes with exactly what Patrick was saying. It comes with some boilerplate schema metadata in this YAML file that we need to edit. This is your schema file. Um, and the cookie cutter tries to add a few classes for you. It, it adds a few slots and it adds an enumeration um, and it adds this boilerplate on top. And the boilerplate is actually, is pretty important, right? So I mentioned just briefly that LinkML tries to ground a lot of its semantics in the semantic web. It tries to hide some of that complexity sort of in plain sight, we like to say. <clears throat> so every LinkML model that's generated with the cookie cutter comes with an identifier and it comes with a name, a title, a description, and a license. <clears throat> and so that all needs to be unique within a project. Um, you, you'll get it for free being unique by using a cookie cutter. But that's sort of like the semantic pinning of this particular set of schema elements to a particular URL. We also have a heavy reliance on uh, a query form of a uh, universal identifier, right? So a short form of a URI. And this section kind of talks about how we map those short forms of the URIs to the longer form. For this for this example, any LinkML element that we use, in particular like a, a data type, like string or LinkML type like URI, is going to have the prefix of LinkML, and it's going to resolve to this idea, uh, address. So all that to say, you can kind of keep, when you're just starting out, this boilerplate in place. And we'll see in a bit how to edit this prefix list when you want to add more stuff, but we're just not there yet. It also gives you a default prefix of the name of your repository and a default range of strings. So that means that any new element type you add, any new slot, any new attribute, any new column for, you know, depending on the serialization uh, language you're used to, is going to have a default uh, range of a string. And we'll change all that as well. This section is called imports. I mentioned briefly that you can import one LinkML schema into another LinkML schema. And because LinkML is written in LinkML, we're going to import those data types from the LinkML package itself. 
again, kind of just boilerplate. So what I'm going to do as a first step here is just remove all of this, all of the classes it added for me and all of the slots. <clears throat> because we're not talking about persons in this tutorial, we're talking about samples. All right, so now we just sort of have a bare classes collection, a bare slots collection, a bare enums collection. And if we think back to our, our implicit model, I wish I could share two screens right now, but I can't. But we have um, a particular bio sample. It has, it's taken from water and it has a depth um, and it has maybe a type, that ontology term that I, that I was showing earlier. The, where it was taken from. And so if I think about um, a particular spreadsheet as, as a group of attributes that describe a single thing, then that single thing is what I call a link ML class. So because that single thing that I'm trying to describe in this example is the, a biological sample, I might create a class here called biosample. And, you know, that's, that's it, that's a, that's a link ML class. It has no attributes, but it, it is putting a, a, a stake in the ground of what we're, we're think, calling things in our model and what we're calling attributes or, or slots. <clears throat> and so in link ML, you can add a lot of documentation. <laughs> uh, I'm using Copilot. I don't know if anyone else uses Copilot, but it's really trying hard to do the work for me, which is nice. Um, but in, in link ML, you can define a lot of metadata on your classes. So I can write a description right out of the bat. Um, I can say that this class biosample is really a particular, an object of that class is a sample of biological material. And that description is gonna get posted all the way to my online documentation for me. I know it has a, a couple of attributes, these slots. Um, I, you know, I know from my slides that it probably has an identifier. I'm just gonna say ID here. It might have a depth. Right, it might have uh, a sample type <clears throat> that was the envo term that described the biome, or maybe I want to say sample biome type if I want to be more descriptive. Um, it might have other things about that sample. It could be, um, you know, it could I could want to try to record the latitude it was taken or the longitude, for example. I'm, I'm describing uh, attributes of that sample class. <clears throat> Right, and so one of the things that LinkML lets you do as well is define your slots outside of the classes that they're in so that you can add more metadata to those slots as well. So <laughs> I, didn't actually, I didn't actually think uh, Copilot was gonna be so, so helpful here, but let's just take its examples, right? So it's making these slots, Copilot knows about LinkML. It can, it can kind of fill in some of these uh, uh, metadata requirements for me. So for an identifier, I'm gonna, write a description for that identifier, identifier of the sample. We'll get to these in a minute. The depth, it's gonna give me the depth, right? It's even gonna give me like a, I can even say it's a float. I might change that to an int, who knows, right? Or an integer. I might keep the sample biome type a string for now. We'll get to in a bit how to make this an enumeration and constrain it a little bit more. Latitude, let's make it a float. Yeah, that makes sense, right? And I'm, I'm writing a description for each one of those and I'm kind of harping on the description but I think that's really a place where you can bring different communities in your group together. So you might have some technologists that really understand what required an identifier and type means co computationally, but you might have a subject matter expert that really knows what they mean by depth and that this, this description is not adequate for depth, right? You might wanna say the depth of a sample taken in centimeters, right? Or, you know, uh, the idea of the, the identifier of the sample starting um, with, you know, some prefix with the prefix <laughs> soil <clears throat> sample. So these descriptions are just text, but they can be very informative when you're trying to share your model with other people, um, right? And LinkML provides some metadata to let you identify, you know, identifiers in your schema, which means that they have to be, you know, a unique value and uh, they're required by default. It also lets you specify whether or not something is required. So if, if depth is required across all my data sets, I can, of course, write required true here, and then it can't be null, um, and then it gives you a type. And that type can be any. Right now, I'm gonna change that to URI or Curie, and then, um, you know, LinkML will validate that's in a Curie form of an identifier or a URI form of an identifier. All right, so let me just quickly check 
my notes here about where we are. Um, so we talked about description, we talked about identifier, we talked a little bit about range. Let's do a little bit more with classes here. So let's let's take the notion that our 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 sample is really coming from not just a lake, but maybe some other kinds of biomes, for example, right? So we might want to be taking uh, the depth of a sample in a lake, or we might want to be taking the depth of our sample in the soil, right? So let's do a little bit more here in terms of restriction, um, right? So let's see. Right. Okay. You can't see my slides, but if you're following along on the slides, you can see that what we really want to do is expand our model to allow us to have different kinds of of samples, not just from the lake, not just from the soil, not just from the air, but from anything, including like, let's let's see if we can use the same representation of a sample to describe a sample from Mars, right? Like we want to be able to use this model over and over again and not have someone have to define what sample is again in their project. Um, and so this is where um, Lincoln Mel's hierarchical modeling comes into play. So we, we have this sample, it has some slots, but you know, if you were to to say, I actually, I am actually taking samples from the air. I'm not taking them from from the from the ground or from a lake. And so depth here is not really useful to me, right? So I might be tempted to just, of course, you know, make a new one and repeat all of those those things again. And maybe in this class, I'm going to just remove depth, right? But then every time I need to, you know, edit this, I'm editing one class, and we want to use some really, you know, convenient programming principles here and not repeat ourselves. So, you know, what we could do is, is use LinkML's concept of a class hierarchy and make a class that can describe both of them using the shared attributes between them. So I might just define a sample in general and not worry about whether it's from the air or from the ground or from the lake. Um, and I might, you know, say that, that all samples have an ID, all have a latitude and longitude, and all have this type but that maybe my soil sample here, not just a bio sample, but a soil sample might also have the depth field. And instead of repeating myself, I am going to make soil sample <clears throat> via the is a component here, link ML. I'm gonna say the soil sample really is just a sample and that what that's gonna do is inherit all of the properties of the sample class into the soil class. But I'm also gonna add to that depth. So all of my samples have these four, four attributes or properties, uh, but soil sample also has depth. And in air, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to say it is a sample. Uh, it's going to inherit ID and sample biome type and latitude and longitude. But instead of depth, I'm going to have altitude. And so down here in my slots, I'm going to add something called altitude. It's going to give a description. It's going to be a float again. And off we go. So now I have three different classes, a sample class, which represents sort of a generic sampling of any kind, a soil sample class, which represents the properties of a sample, but also includes depth because I'm taking it deep in the ground. I also have an air sample class that's talking about the properties that are unique to that class, but inherit the sample as well. And of course, make a water sample. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. <laughs> Let's see what else it gives us here. I'm sure it's, yep, it's gonna give us a sample going to say it's a description of water, it's going to have a depth as well. So that's sort of how you can use the class hierarchy in LinkML to describe more specific implementations of your classes. Um, let's see if I forgot anything here. Right. <clears throat> so we have a couple of those. We are sharing them. And now I think uh, if I look back on our schedule, Patrick, you can confirm, I think we had planned to take a little break here before we get into more yeah we have a we have a break scheduled at, at 10 after um at 10. which was supposed to be covering up through uh hierarchies so, so yeah i um i think we could probably just take if there's like a um say questions if if there if there are any before we do a break at 10 after absolutely <clears throat> So far, it's pretty simple. I mean, you're, you're basically just describing classes and slots or tables and columns or, you know, 
objects and properties uh, about your domain. And so as long as you're able to do that sort of relatively easily as a modeler, LinkML should be pretty easy to, to learn as well. Um, there's definitely more complex syntax here uh, that we'll get into after the break. Can you hear me? No. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. For the is a field, when you, when you say sample, is it known what, what the vocabulary is for that? Right, so it defaults to thinking that that particular class is within the model you're defining. Uh, if you wanted to say, uh, for example, if you wanted to bring in a different model outside of yours, right now LinkML would want you to import that into LinkML. So you you couldn't say is a, for example, schema.org colon sample. But there are ways to map the class that you're making to an external uh, schema. So I could say this sample has an exact mapping, for example, and we'll get to this in the tutorial, to schema.org.sample. Yeah, sorry, I, um, for a lot of the stuff, my screen wasn't updating automatically, so I, I couldn't see your mouse moving unless I reforced a reload or whatever. Oh, do you know? It seems, it seems to be working now, but. Oh, good. Oh, good. And again, um, maybe I'll just, I'll um, just point out that if you want to check out that repo at a particular step, like if you check out step one modeling, you can follow along with all the modeling I'm doing. I'm actually looking at my, you know, at that repo on the side here and just trying to echo what we have there. So um, you can see a much more descriptive schema if you just check out that repo. I guess one thing that I didn't add yet that I think is kind of important to that question. Um, it, and again, these are very simple things that you just don't have in other modeling languages. So if I look at LinkML, you know, I might want to put an alias here. I hope that came through yet in the share. I want to put an alias here where, you know, another name for this could be biosample, right? So if somebody's searching for what a biosample is in my shared model that has become super popular on the web and everybody wants to use this as their sample model, they can find it pretty easily with just a search on the online documentation. Um, and so just small things like that are gonna help make that community development around a shared standard much easier. Um, uh, there's more here, but I, I, I wanna wait for questions. You can always interrupt me, of course. Are, is, is BioSample, are, is an alias case sensitive or not? Uh, it's, let's see, I, so you're asking like, do I need this one too? <laughs> yeah, I just I, don't, I mean, I don't it, it, <laughs> I hope it, not. This, this would be accepted. And so I guess there's, a, yeah, so it's not case sensitive. It is case sensitive, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, I have a few, uh, uh, I guess, maybe questions. On our, so like, we've used uh, Cross, is like gutter to clone Basically, to reproduce your template setup for a LinkML repository, we've published that on GitHub, and and now, so I don't know. Maybe first, could you could you walk us through quickly, like the all the folders that got created there, like yeah. focus the YAML file, but like there's a lot of things that that are in that repo. Yep, that's a great idea. Um, so. Yeah, so you've created this repo using our cookie cutter. And the cookie cutter is just like a, a bootstrapping template software that creates the GitHub repository, GitHub directory here. Dot GitHub has all of the GitHub actions that we think are important for LinkML. So your main GitHub action, without going into too much detail about GitHub actions, is just a technology to run thing, jobs in the background based on your repository commits or your branches that you make. But it's got a main one that's going to run some tests. And it's also going to run, you know, this PyPy publish action when you make a release, which is going to push up to the Python version of your model to PyPy, so somebody could, you know, um, you know, bring in your model to their software packages. It's going to, you know, run this command, which generates a test implementation of your documentation, so you can look at it on your pull request in particular and see that if the documentation is generating the way you want it to. Um, so that's your, your GitHub action to get for free with the cookie cutter. Uh, you also, uh, you get a, a, a docs directory. We'll talk about that in a minute. That it's not checked into GitHub here because it's generating that doc uh, for deploy, deploying on the GitHub pages repository um, branch. Uh, 
Uh, you get an examples folder, which has, again, template default entries of actual data that would match the meta model that the cookie cutter gave you. So the first thing you're going to want to do is remove this as well, because we're not talking about people anymore, maybe even rename it, right? We're going to rename it to samples. And it makes this project directory. And so for LinkML, there's that first set of it, which is the meta model, which we're kind of going through in this section. The other half is the framework and tools. And one of that tool set is to generate a bunch of different serializations of your model. So this project directory holds all those generations. And by default, the cookie cutter will generate the model that you create in Excel format, GraphQL, JSON-LD, JSON schema, OWL, et cetera. So if I look in here, the first thing it does in an SQL schema generation is it's going to make that default schema and check it in in SQL data definition language. Right. Or if I look at the JSON schema, it's going to check in the JSON schema version of that default syntax. And we're going to show you in the tutorial how to regenerate all this because clearly it's still boilerplate, still talking about people and not, and not samples. <clears throat> so that's the project directory. It's kind of an important one. And then our source is, you know, where you're going to do most of your editing. This source docs directory gives you the hook in to edit your doc. Uh, manually. So if you had some tutorials on how to edit your schema, for example, you might want to put that those markdown files in here, and then it'll get bundled in that GitHub action to be deployed with the rest of your automatic documentation. And right here is kind of a very important uh, directory. It's where your model lives. So in the schema subdirectory is where your YAML file lives. That's where we're editing in this tutorial today. It's what I've been working on here. And in the data model directory is the Python data classes version of your model. So again, we haven't gotten to data gener the code generation yet, but so it's still generating it off the, the template person class, but we'll get to how you generate that off of the new model that you've created as well. And then it also comes with a set of tests. Very simple, just a template of how you write tests in the unit test framework here. It basically loads up your YAML file with a target class on it and runs through and sees if the example data that it generated itself works. <laughs> So again, we're going to have to edit all of that, but it gives you an example. So if you generate the, from the cookie cutter, you at least have an example to set up to get started on. And then it generates all of these different files. You know, this has to do with poetry, tells you your, your requirements. It generates a make file with example commands on how to generate all of those different uh, serializations of your model, license, code of conduct, git ignore. And this cruft.json is just what tells cruft how to look for changes in the upstream cookie cutter. So if you if you never run cruft update, join the club. <laughs> Oftentimes we don't necessarily run cruft because the whole point of a cookie cutter is just to get you started to bootstrap it. And then there's a lot of customizations that you can do yourself and you may not want any updates from LinkML after that. But if you do, that's the config file that, that controls it. <clears throat> so, so, so what happens in games? Of, so I guess the LinkML spec evolves with time or something and 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 uh, so like uh, and um, I, I mean i'm not talking about breaking changes like a uh, major versions versus minor versions i don't think but like like let's say there are some updates I, I guess you will expect your community of link ml users to to update their their schemas to the latest version right absolutely to, yeah yeah i mean and you can do that two ways like you can i think cruft gets confusing because cruft is really telling you I'm going to update how I want a LinkML project to be configured. Let's say we changed from having, you know, the schema live in source in our cookie cutter to the schema living in, in a subdirectory called schema, right? We would make that change in our cookie cutter. And if you run cruft update, suddenly your project is going to change here and it's going to not, it's no longer going to have a source. It's going to have a schema subdirectory. So those kinds of changes are handled through cruft, which again, we make very infrequently. Um, we, you have to hear, our history is in the Oboe Foundry and the ontology development community, where they have these tools that help you generate your own ontology. And what they found over time was that they want to fix things. They want to get better in their project bootstrapping software. And there's no way to do that for all the downstream dependencies. Luckily, we enter, you know, later in the development, the 20 years later in the development of these kind of things, and there are tools available. So Cruft helps you do that. If you want to just update the syntax of a LinkML model, or let's say we put in a new generator. Now we're generating 
uh, I don't know, XYZ language code, a better Java generator, for example, then you just have to update your dependencies, right? You'll just, instead of getting this bootstrapped LinkML runtime at 1.1.24, you update to 1.2. And you do that in your pyproject.toml or whatever requirements file that you choose to, to use for your project. So two different kinds of updates here. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, so let's take. Oh. oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just gonna segue into the break in case oh, you right. were looking right. at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so according to schedule, uh, we're gonna we have a short break here, so we'll reconvene at uh, twenty five after. So that's like ten minutes from now. Perfect. All right, we should probably get back started again. Uh, get into some of the fun stuff. Hopefully we've set the stage of the easy stuff. Okay, so I am actually, if you're following along on the slideshow, I am on slide 57. I'm not gonna share it. It's just a cute image generated by the Bing image generator. So I'll just talk through it and just share my PyCharm screen instead. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is like how, you know, when you're a modeler of any kind of thing, an ontology, a schema, whatever, you're not living in a vacuum. It's, mo it's most likely that lots of people have done the same kind of modeling that we're doing today. And one of the best ways that LinkML helps this, this trouble where everybody's creating the same model with slightly different syntax, but we're all talking about the same thing, is to provide you some hooks to allow you to map your model to another model. So, you know, one of the, the best resources that I like to use when I'm looking at trying to, to define classes in my model is something like the Ontology Lookup Service, OLS, or BioPortal. Uh, oftentimes, they have a lot of definitions for things already made for you that you might want to replicate in your model or map to. So LinkML has a has a, a meta model component called mappings. There's several different kinds of mappings you can make in LinkML. The one that we like to have people use the most is exact mappings. These are just like RDF mappings. You can look up the definition of these in the LinkML meta model. But it just it's giving you a way to say that my definition of a sample, for example, is exactly equivalent to the definition used in an external source without having to, you know, refer to that source within, without having to import it into your model. So one of the models that I work on a lot is BioLink. It's a LinkML model that describes sort of high level biology from genomics all the way through clinical research uh, in the human domain, kind of in the human biology uh, uh, domain. And so I can say, for example, that I know I wanna make an exact mapping to the BioLink definition of sample. Another one that I might want to do is, you know, schema thing. Now you have to kind of think when you're making these exact mappings, is that true? In schema.org, which is again defined by this prefix map up here, is the definition of thing the same as a sample? We, we really might want to be careful here, right? Because thing is probably much more broad than sample. So I can use something called broad mappings again to define that you know, if you're looking at my model and you you know what a thing is in schema.org, but you don't know what a sample is, you might want to consider that thing is a little bit more broad than sample, something like that. There's also, you know, narrower mappings. Um, so if I wanted to say that this was narrowly mapped to, um, uh, let's see, another model, uh, NMDC that I talked about earlier, maybe NMDC has a biosample class, and I want to map to that. And so in that, Here's, here's an interesting case where I'm going to need to edit my prefix map because I've just introduced a prefix that this particular model doesn't know about yet, the NMDC prefix. So up here in my prefixes collection, and Patrick will probably show you this when we talk about validation, you'll, you'll get an error if you don't do this. So, so LinkML kind of protects you against making these kinds of errors. But I need to define what I mean by NMDC. It's one of those RDF in plain sight kind of things. I need to say that NMDC refers to this site w3.id.org and MDC, and within that context, within that model, they have a biosample class and it's narrowly mapped. It's, it's more specific than my sample class. So that's sort of how you use mappings. A lot of our generators will, will uh, recognize these mappings. We'll make a, a link to them. Another really important component in the meta model that you can use here is, is class URI. So if you really are um, you know, interested in making the RDF version of your model, and you know that that your class that you're defining in LinkML is exactly equivalent to, again, BioLink sample in this example, 
I can say that the class URI for this class is BioLink sample. And what LinkML will do is then go translate BioLink sample into the full URI and make that your RDF class. So it'll kind of ignore all of this metadata and say, because you've specified the URI for me, I'm going to go and use the definition in BioLink. So that's an important one if you really do want to be um, you know, heavy on the reuse side of a particular model. <clears throat> um, another one that's very handy here uh, is, is um, slot usage. And we're going to talk about that f more in different, in different um, contexts here. But there's a meta model component called slot usage. It allows you to specify how to use a slot within the context of a class. So you might have a, a, a you know an identifier that is represented by ID. It's a slot. It's a very common slot. But in one class, you might want to have the identifier use a query that is specific to that class. And in another class, you want it to use an identifier query uh, or, or URI that's specific to that class. So you know maybe in my sample class, I say that the you know the ID is is fine. But maybe down in in my soil sample, I want to say <clears throat> that the ID has to be of a particular of a particular kind. So I might say here pattern, and um, let me just make sure I'm getting the the simple. Yeah, okay. So I might say that the ID here has to be it has to start with a prefix of soil sample, and it can be any numbers or letters, and that's how it ends. So this is actually a regular expression. It's using a keyword pattern, and it's saying the slot ID in this class must start with soil sample as a prefix. Whereas I might have a completely different slot usage down here in the air sample and say that my air sample, you know, has to start with a pattern of the air. And, and this is just one way of constraining that identifier. It's just to sort of, sort of show you how you can use regular expressions to constrain a string to something more than, than just any letters and numbers and, 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 and digits, et cetera. <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, for the topic before, when you were talking about the reuse for, for classes and those things. So let's say, for instance, uh, uh, Rob here develops a, 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 a schema about uh, marine biology. And, and, and I, I, I'm working on my marine biology too, but I'm not aware that he's developing this schema. So, so like, is there a way to, like, like if it's not on, uh, on, on one of the main repos to, to discover what he's doing and, and perhaps like yeah. either say I'm, I'm map terms from, from, from my stuff to his stuff or, or to completely reuse and add things to his. Yep. Um, there's, so there's two ways I can think of. One is you can use LinkML to serialize your model into OWL. And then you can, of course, submit that OWL to any of these, you know, ontology repositories. You can submit it to BioPortal or Ontology Lookup Service or any of the other ones that exist or sort of as registries of all of this space. The other thing we have at LinkML, <clears throat> which I don't think I can show you without stopping my share, <clears throat> but I'll put it in the chat after I'm done talking. We do have a LinkML registry, and we ask people to sort of like manually register their their schema. So that's like very low tech. People don't do it very often. You make a great point. Like, how do we discover these things? We're hoping to develop that registry out in the next couple of years if we, you know, based on funding. But right now it's a little manual. The 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 schemas we work on are serialized to OWL and then they they're shoved up into into Ontology the Lookup Service and BioPortal. So if you actually went and looked in Ontology Lookup Service for BioLink, you'd find the classes and slots and stuff uh, in that in that repository. But it's a very good point. And I think another thing that we're trying to do is host like uh, monthly community meetings, again, low tech, um, but we have people present their work and then we kind of make make note of these kind of different efforts that are happening in the LinkML space, at least. Um, I don't know, Patrick, Kevin, do you guys have any other ways that you would go about finding a schema? Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're more geared towards um, Python, some people do publish um, to PyPI. It's not much of a discovery discoverability there, but <clears throat> it is a way to you know to to share something between between projects. Um, it's probably the only other thing I can think of, but I, I think Sierra, what you covered is probably the, the main answer to that question. Maybe, maybe GitHub um, like tags on repositories. 
which is just, you know, find a link ML, you know, tagged project that happens to look like a cookie cutter schema that we used also. Thank you. Yeah, honestly, that's actually a really good way to do it. If you look in the link ML repository itself, you know, GitHub provides you already uh, a link to the dependencies on your project, right? So you can say which projects actually use link ML and it'll give you kind of like an automated registry of all the different places that that cookie cutter has been used. It's, it's an interesting idea. I, I like that one, Kevin. Um, okay, so we are mapping around here. Um, we've sort of talked about that and we talked about slot usage a little bit. Um, you know, I think another thing to remember, again, not a very technical implementation here, but this description is probably not that great, right? And if we're really committed to using reusable components here, it's likely that we're looking in ontology lookup service or for another ontology term that describes this better. And before the meeting, of course, I went and looked this up and there is a much better definition for what we're, what we're meaning here by sample. And I'm just going to copy and paste it in. It's from, uh, a ontology called SIO, um, Semantic Integrated Ontology, I think. I can't remember the, the definition of that. But it it has, you know, a very good definition for a sample. And again, I'm going to just link directly to that definition. So yes, I'm kind of duplicating effort here. I'm kind of like copying and pasting that. Um, and I think there's a real trade-off there between being very descriptive of your modeling to somebody who's using it who has no idea what an ontology is or whether or not ontology lookup surface exists or you know anything and and trying not to to repeat yourself so usually what i do for my models is i use a definition that i like it might be specific to my project but i make sure i put in that mapping to a, an actual ontology term so if somebody did want to look this up they could just google it they'd find the description would be about the same or 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 maybe even identical and they'd have a way to understand what I was talking about outside the context of our specific project. Um, let's see. And then I think the last thing I wanted to say here, we talked about patterns, we talked about, uh, oh yeah, ID prefixes. So another way I can constrain my model is this concept of ID prefixes. And again, we're sort of, we're very concerned about the, the, the short form URI representation in link amount. So we're gonna talk about prefixes a lot. We're gonna talk about expanding those into URIs. This ID prefixes is construct allows you to say that for, for this class, the identifier for it should come from XYZ repository. So if I really, if this wasn't an example and I really was taking samples from the environment and putting them in a database, I could say that, you know, my prefix my my class must come from a prefix space like NMDC, right? And that's actually an ordered list. So if you look at the BioLink model, for example, we have, uh, you know, a class for gene. And in that ID prefixes construct, you might see all sorts of different resources that are available already for genes. You might see ensemble, you might see, uh, you know, the, the equivalent at uh, of course, now I'm uh, NCBI, right? Like there's all these different kinds of resources that provide gene identifiers. And that's a ranked list. So you can kind of say in your model, I prefer uh, NCBI gene identifiers first. And then if you can't find an NCBI gene identifier for this class, then look for the ensemble identifier, et cetera. And that gives you a way to both be broad enough to allow harmonization of resources across many different spaces, but also narrow enough to show an indication to your user about what they can expect in that field. <clears throat> so very low tech, but very helpful when you're when you're doing this kind of work. All right. And then I think I'm going to stop there uh, and and switch topics over to enumerations. And I'm going to stop my share and try to share the slides again, because I think it's just easier to see some from some boilerplate here. Let's see if it'll let me stop and restart. Do you know? <clears throat> And I guess, I guess I'll just sort of fill the space while I'm waiting for Juno to respond. It, it, there are a lot of modeling components that we can't sort of cover in this tutorial. If you're interested, if we sparked your interest, I would definitely try to go and look at that documentation for the Lincoln on Metal model. You can do all sorts of things. You can make rules that say for this slot, if I have this value, then make sure that this other slot is of this value. There's rule syntax. 
you know, there's all sorts of different kinds of like unique keys. I can say these four slots uh, must be unique in the context of all the other, you know, rows in my table. There's a lot of comp, there's a lot of stuff there that you can, can do. Um, all right. I'm going to put a link in the chat, just like the, if, if there's one documentation play, page you want to start from to get more like advanced topics in modeling, that the link I just put in is probably where to start. Perfect. Thank you. I wanted to sort of briefly cover enumerations in LinkML because this is a really great place for ontologies to come into your model. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. So this is a particular enumeration. Again, it's a completely different use case. So just bear with me. But you know, enumerations in LinkML kind of have this structure in the YAML. They have a name and then they have a list of permissible values. So what this means is like nanotube, if I'm trying to validate data according to my model and I say that the, the data uh, slots range is this enumeration, then the values of that data slot must be one of these permissible values in literally this context. But what you can do further with LinkML is you can attract attra you can assign a meaning to each of those two. So if you want your users to be able to just write nanotube in their spreadsheet and validate it, great. But behind the scenes, you can say the meaning of the nanotube is actually this ontology term. And when we generate things, it'll replace those, you know, nice features for users to just be able to type in what they want with the actual meaning of that ontology. You can get a little bit more complicated too. You can use the LinkML component reachable from, which says, you know, I know that everything in this particular uh, slot, we're going to call it maybe biome, and it's going to have a range of this biome enumeration. All of the values of that should be reachable from the Envo ontology. So this is basically a clue to LinkML that says, hey, any Envo term here is going to make sense for me. And you can be a little bit more specific and say, well, the source node is actually the top level term I want from Envo is biome. I don't want anything else in this other branch. So if you're thinking about something like the gene ontology, which has three branches, cellular component, biological process, molecular function, I can say that the source node for that is just molecular function and then all the ontology terms in molecular function will be value, but valid, but not cellular component, et cetera. Uh, there's, all, there's a whole bunch of more metadata you can assign to these enumerations. So for example, I can say that I only want the terms in this ontology that are subclass of biome, right? I don't want part of, I don't want related to other predicates that you might use in the ontology. And you can have Boolean combinations as well. So if I say that this, you know, non-aquatic biome is reachable from Envo and its source is biome, but I don't, you know, I don't want to get anything else underneath biome from Alpine or Mediterranean or whatever, I can subtract out parts of that ontology. So I would say that the only caveat here with these kinds of of constructs is that because LinkML supports so many different serializations of your model, um, you know some of these components are better supported in different gener in different serializations. So you might have full support for this kind of feature in JSON schema, but you might not have full support for it in you know the TypeScript generator. And that's just a mark of our open source project. But this is the idea here. And even if the generated code isn't exactly you know um, you know, serializing this entire enumeration for you, what it does show you is metadata to your users and to your development staff and to your subject matter experts on your project, what you mean by this field. And honestly, low tech, but incredibly important um, to sharing models. <clears throat> All right, so we talked about that. We talked a little bit about slot usage. We talked a little bit about pattern constraints and ID prefixes. Um, as, as Patrick put in the chat, he put in a great link for you. Here's another one. There's more advanced constructs. Uh, just a, a quick question. Uh, moving on. So, so, like, yeah. so how do? You, so we, we saw that like, okay, I, I will write a spec in uh, in uh, in LinkML, um, and then if I use it to convert to these uh, these other formats like a JSON schema or something like, mm -hmm. how how do these rules? Uh, translate basically like like the, the exclusion and like like i guess from one um, from one language to another like there will there will be there will be a difference in the stuff that you, we cannot express maybe you're exactly right and some of our serializations are just not capable of supporting the rich syntax of linkml for example json schema doesn't really have a hierarchical 
representation of its of its objects really um so you know there's there's things that we do to help with that right you could you can you can make some um in jason's schema for example you can have a reference to another class right you can you can do some of that stuff but not all of our serializations will support the entire syntax there are some syntaxes in some syntax elements in LinkML that will only serve OWL or RDF, for example, like the slot and class URI. None of that really matters to an SQL serialization of the model. That, that language just doesn't really support the concept of a class or a slot URI, but it's incredibly important in the RDF serialization. So, you know, we're trying to be sort of like a toolkit that lets you reach your model into a lot of different technology stacks, but you're right. There's sometimes it just isn't supported. Um, uh, but again, I'll say that even just having metadata to describe your slots and classes can go a long way to helping your users reuse your data. I, I'm not exaggerating when I say we just get a spreadsheet and we don't even know what the meta model is, right? So um, I don't know. D does anyone else, Patrick, Kevin, you want to respond to that as well? Yeah, I think I was actually just going to kind of make the same point that you just sort of made at the end there, which is that like, <clears throat> you know, um, not every tool in the LinkML ecosystem does or even can support every LinkML meta model construct, uh, as you pointed out. And so, at the end of the day, you know, some sometimes the value in adding those to your LinkML model is is just is that it's a form of documentation, and that's useful as well. You know, you're at least like you at least have a, a structured way of saying what, <laughs> what you mean. <laughs> and hopefully most tools understand it, but sometimes, yeah, you will, you will, you know, bump up against a tool that doesn't understand what reachable from means or can't do anything with it. Um, we, we try to make that as clear as possible, but you know, it's always, a, it's always a challenge. And the last, oh, the other thing I will also say is that, you know, the LinkML metal model itself sort of tends to work work ahead of the rest of the tooling. So new features might get added into the LinkML meta model, but it'll take a take it'll take time for those to get like picked up and and utilized in the tooling, like in the generators that we'll talk about in a little bit. Sierra, you're muted. You're muted. Oh my gosh, I was muted. Okay, so the only the last thing I'll say with modeling um, for this part of the, the tutorial is just that LinkML does try to handle deprecation just like a software project would. Um, you know, it's really important not to just delete elements out of your schema. As I said before, sometimes community development is the most important thing about your model. You want people to reuse your model. You don't want them to do it over again. And so if you're going to change something, if you're going to deprecate sample or bio sample and turn it into sample, you want to give people a heads up. And also, like because we're so grounded in RDF and in the semantic web, we really want those elements to stick around forever. If you give something a URI or a query, you don't want it to just disappear because, number one, it's hard for people to, to you know, use your schema and then migrate if they're not ready to migrate yet. But it's also, it's really important to, like, um, uh, tell yourself <laughs> that you have changed your model, right? So like if I deprecate Gene and then I thought, oh, you know, Sierra, that was stupid. I don't want to deprecate Gene. I want to have a record of that. So pretty common sense here. Um, but LinkML provides a couple of meta model elements that are helpful. So you can have the deprecated meta model component on your schema. You can say, and it's actually the, the range of the deprecated meta model element is string so you can write a description about why it was deprecated, for example. You can also use the deprecated element has exact replacement meta model component. So you can say, well, if I deprecated bio sample, for example, I can replace that with the sample class. And it gives both programmatically and just from a documentation point of view, the user an idea to say, oh, go ahead and replace my bio sample class with sample. I can also track the last time this meta model component was updated and who and who updated it again helps with like project cohesion um and then there's this there's a couple of interesting little things that we've just recently added to the 
the stack where, you know, depending on your reliance on RDF or on, on your online documentation, you can include or exclude those deprecated elements. So I guess our, our best practice here is never delete anything out of your model, but if you have to deprecate something, put it in another YAML file and include it where you need to. So include it in generating your online on online documentation. Include it when you're you're generating a LinkML YAML that you want someone programmatically to use downstream of your application. If somebody wants to reuse, for example, my BioLink model, I want to provide them a YAML file that includes the deprecated elements because maybe they're not ready to upgrade. But you can also exclude it. So if you have part of your application is really dependent on a JSON schema and you don't want to see those deprecated elements, that makes perfect sense. You don't want someone to accidentally put them in there. You can exclude them from the generation of your online documentation or from your JSON schema generated um, element. <clears throat> and I just wanted to introduce really quickly something that's in beta right now with LinkML. We know that as models change and as your project grows and, and biology evolves, <laughs> nothing is going to stay the same. And there is a space in LinkML to, to write a declarative transformation. So for example, if we're saying latitude and longitude are actually pretty, excuse me, outdated concepts when you're talking about locating something on the globe, and instead people want to start saying just what the GPS position is. I'm not an expert on geography, so if this is a dumb example, forgive me. But if I did want to convert latitude and longitude in existing data with existing schemas into that GPS position uh, uh, slot, I could write a declarative transform in LinkML syntax using the LinkML map tool that says for samples, I want to get the samples from this sample class, but I want to derive a new slot. And the GPS position is actually latitude plus longitude. And you can write all sorts of different expressions here and just you know, have a way to help people migrate their data to your new schema. Also record how you've been transforming that schema, let people see the transformation that's happening. And um, you know, again, all about transparency and, and how you manage your data. <clears throat> But it's beta, so that's one of our areas of development. We're really rounding out this, this tool in the next year. <clears throat> OK, and uh, we work for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Our, our PI is Chris Mungle. And if you've ever heard of Chris Mungle, you know he likes to stay on the forefront of technology, and so do we. And so we've been experimenting a lot with uh, large language models and LinkML. We have a um, large language model you know, component that you can plug into your ChatGPT online interface, and you can ask LinkML questions to that little agent. Directly, you can say, what does the meta model component slot usage mean? How do I use deprecation? It'll respond very nicely. Um, if you've never used a large language model before, just don't be afraid to ask it direct questions. It knows a heck of a lot about LinkML, and it can really help you start. Um, you can also ask it to generate a schema based on a bunch of text that you give it. So I've tried to you know, take a, an abstract from a paper, for example, and say, generate me a schema in LinkML, and it will do that. Um, some caveats, Link LLMs love to hallucinate identifiers and they make syntax mistakes sometimes. So what I really use it for is when I'm trying to learn a new software development tool, I use it a lot to give me uh, sort of like a bootstrap or a leg up in doing it. And you can do that with LinkML as well. <clears throat> okay, I thank you for enough from me. <laughs> we, uh, this is a rest stop. So if you wanna get a fully working schema um, and you weren't able to keep up with just typing, you can check out that, that uh, the modeling tag here. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing, I believe, because I think I'm going to turn it over to someone else now. Yeah, Patrick. <clears throat> and I'm going to start sharing. OK. Um, so this should be a pretty short section about um, schema linting. Um, so uh, schema linting is sort of just a fancy way of saying like enforcing some best practices in your um, schema schema development. You know, as as we saw, um, primarily we write our LinkML models in a YAML file, which kind of leaves for a, quite a bit of flexibility, which can be good, but sometimes maybe not so good. So as a quick, like, motivating example, like, let's imagine that I had this, um, had this schema where I have a, 
a class called latitude space longitude and that's it's that's actually perfectly fine as far as um yaml is concerned but if i you know and we'll talk about this in more detail but it's we've hinted at a number of times that you can you can generate python code from your um from your schema and so if if we were to just be completely naive and like translate that class name from your yaml file into into the python code like this is this is like a non-starter because that's like not even like valid uh, python syntax so we, we we just simply can't do that what we do end up doing is like you know fudging this class class name a little bit into you know latitude longitude without the space but now there's a bit of confusion here because well i have a class name in my yaml file with a space in it but if i'm working with the python generated artifact as well it has a different class name so it's kind of like mm, it's confusing there so obviously the right answer is that like i should have named it differently i should have named that class differently like right from right from the get-go um and so the linkml linter is a tool that's designed to kind of help suss out these issues um before you find out about them the hard way um and so it's kind of a it's a it's a rule-based tool so it just checks a bunch you know a series of rule it checks your schema against a series of rules that it considers to be best practices um and it's configurable too um so that is um that's the basic um structure of the command but let's um i mean let's just dive right in and and run it against our schema now i've i've checked out the i have this set to uh, i've checked out the the tag where sierra left off um so this may look slightly different than what you have but um you know i so you you may get slightly different answers than i get but uh, it should be pretty pretty similar so anyway um so i'm going to say poetry run link ml lint and then i'm just going to give it the directory where our schema lives you can point it to a file or a directory and um so we got a few issues here um and if i flip over here um we can kind of break them down a little bit um the first part of what it's telling you is just it's giving you uh, some indication of the severity can generate warnings or errors based on how you configure this thing. Um, it's telling you what rule is being violated. So you can see there's there's some issues with canonical prefixes. There's also some issues with um, from this rule called recommended, uh, which is checking to checking to see if recommended slots have been filled in. Um, sorry, I should say meta model slots have been filled in and then a more detailed description of like what what went wrong here um so there's a few ways we can resolve uh warnings that the linter tells us about one is well, you can just you can just fix it <laughs> you can do the thing that it's telling you to do and in this case um this is telling me that my class air sample does not have the recommended slot called description. So you can see my sample class has a description, but my air sample class doesn't. So I can say description a sample from there. I don't know. Maybe that's a good description, maybe not. And then the next one is similar. It's a class soil sample doesn't have a slot called description. Description. Uh, sample from the soil. Okay. So if I were to run um, this again, aha, so I got rid of those first two, and now I'm just left with some of these canonical prefix issues. Um, now you can uh, read the, there's, if I, if I, sorry. I go back up to the documentation on the the linter 
Um, all these rules are sort of um, spelled out here. And I could read, uh, kind of, oh, it's the very first one. Uh, I can read exactly what it's doing. Um, and it, I, for some of these, I can also see that there's additional like configuration possible. And so I don't, I, I'm not gonna get into all the, the details about what this is trying to check or what this is trying to prevent. Um, but this is just to, um, just to sort of quickly point out that um, if I um, if I want to get rid of these warnings, it, one possibility is to you know fix it so that like it agrees with what the the default linters configuration is expecting, or I can make my own configuration um, in order to say actually I want I want it to check a slightly different thing than 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 the default. And so to start with um, uh, configuring, uh, oops. get back in here. I can make a, a, a linkml lint configuration file. So I'm going to make a new file called dot linkml lint dot yaml. <clears throat> And then I'm going to say that I want to start with the sort of recommended configuration by saying extends recommended. And then from there, I'm going to configure certain rules beyond what the recommended configuration says. And in particular, I'm interested in modifying the canonical prefixes rule. Oh, there's no way I can spell that right. I'm just going to copy that. <laughs> Canonical prefixes. And again, I'm going to refer back to um, the documentation to see, OK, there's a there's this prefix maps context thing that I can tell it about. Again, I we don't I'm not not trying to get into all the details about what this means, but this just sort of uh, uh, a little demo here and I, i'm basically just saying i only want you to i only just only care about the oboe prefixes like that's those are the ones i care the most about um that's essentially what this is saying um and so i could run um poetry run link melon i could tell it you know dash dash config um get back in the slideshow um dash dash config, give it the, the config file. But um, this is, the linter is actually uh, set up to look for this as a conventional file name. So you can name your like config file anything you want. Um, and you could pass the dash dash config option. Or uh, if you just name it um, with this conventional file name, you don't actually have to um, provide it to the to the command line. So since this file now exists, um, I can run the linkml lint command again. And hey, we fixed. So we fixed one issue by modifying our the schema itself, doing what it, what it suggested. And then we resolved the other one by adding a bit of configuration in here. Um, OK. So now that we've kind of gotten like to a good state where the, the linter says like you're doing a good job like authoring this schema, we could even we could now like kind of go beyond beyond the the initial like sort of the, the the default configuration. We can go beyond that and even be even like more strict if we want to. Um, for example, like we could enable another rule. Um, so going back to the documentation, these ones that are marked with a star are part of that recommended set of, basically the default set of rules. And you can see that there's a, there's one in here called tree root class. This is not part of the like recommended set, but if it you know if it's applicable to to your schema, um, 
you're, yeah, you're more than welcome to opt into using it. And in particular, so this is, this is looking for classes that have been marked as tr uh, tree root true in your schema. And you can see that in our uh, schema, we do, we do have one. We have one called sample collection, a class called sample collection um, that's uh, considered to be a, a tree tree root in our schema. And, you know, I, again, this is the, the details of what that means exactly is kind of beside the point. I'll, you know, you could, you could read about it in the link in my documentation. Um, but it, in very briefly, tree root true, just as a, an indication that like, um, if I'm, if I'm, uh, looking at data that's in sort of a, a tree like format, like JSON or YAML, um, that this, this, uh, class court kind of represents the, the root of such a, a tree. Um, okay. So yeah. So if I, um, I can enable this, uh, linter, uh, rule by adding it to my config file, copy that, paste that into my, um, <clears throat> config file. So I'm saying oh, for this rule, I want to enable it by setting the level uh, to error. So any violations of this will be raised at the error level. Um, and um, I'm, I'm telling it, you know, you should expect to see a, a, tr a class with tree root true called sample collection and that it, it really does exist. <laughs> um, so if I run this, that's good. Now, you know, if somebody un, unsuspectingly, uh, you know, or somebody, somebody who's, uh, let's say new to this project, they didn't realize they, they didn't understand why this was important. They accidentally changed this to false. Um, and they ran this, then they would be presented with, uh, you say, Hey, you're supposed to, the linter says you're supposed to have a, a, a tree root class in your schema. Um, and then the last way that we can use the, um, the linter to be more strict is if we add the val dash dash validate command line flag. And what that's going to do is it's just going to do a little sort of extra work to, uh, check that your schema really does adhere to the, the link ML, um, meta model. Um, so coming back over here, <clears throat> uh, it takes a little while, over, a little longer to run when you do this, but, um, yeah, so currently there's no issues, right? This is, this is good. This is what we'd expect. But if I, um, you know, if I said like foo bar here, right, like that's still valid YAML, but it's not, it, this doesn't adhere to the link ML meta model anymore. And so when I run this with dash dash validate, it's going to say in your sample class, you can't, you can't say, you can't put foo there. Like that's not part of the thing. So, so that's, um, that's what the validate flag is all about. And then there's a few, you know, you can check, um, you know, there's a few other interesting command line flags here. You can use dash dash help, help to look at those. You know, it has to do, um, there's, there's things about how warnings are handled and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. Okay. So that's it for, um, for, for linting. It's just a quick little, um, tool that, you know, we use to make sure that we're kind of following some best practices as we're, um, developing our models. And I think I'm handing this over to Kevin now to start talking about documentation, unless there's any questions. Yeah. Um, there we go. <clears throat> And the share. No. Yeah. 
And oh, there's the Windows Forever. Okay. Um, so I think a, a, a key use of LinkML is um, is producing documentation for your model, um, and uh, it's sort of how everyone can know about it and uh, changes. Um, and I can sort of like uh, ad lib that. Uh, I'm a user of a model that that Sierra works on, and it's and and I use um, the documentation quite a bit. Um, so yes, it is it is the um, socialization of the model. Um, so uh, we can um, use a, a generator to um, uh, produce the models, um, and within the project, um, the GitHub action is going to do it. I am. Let's see, um, slightly over, and doc, try it out. Um, oh, no. And this is your beautiful material theme docs that you get. Um, and it, it shows you your classes and slots and enumeration and types. And um, you can navigate down and see. Uh, this is a very important column in a deeper schema to know whether, um, whether the uh, um, Slot has been defined directly, or it comes down via inheritance. And kill that. Uh, it's possible um, to configure your um, your theme um, and the the method of what's produced. And these are some some examples of themes. Uh, and um, this is an example of modifying your template for the documentation. Um, that's I was really focused on the code generation part. Yeah. Uh, the editing in the yeah. yeah. Do you do you want me to show? Yeah. Okay. Ta talk sure. me through it a little bit because I yeah. Oh. Some, some code generation yeah. kind of. <laughs> no, no problem. So what comes with your um, cookie cutter is a, is just basically an about.md, and what happens by default is LinkML will go out <clears throat> and refer to its package container of of Jinja templates. They're just they're again another bootstrapping tool, another boilerplate tool to let you create this documentation. And I just wanted to show sort of briefly here that you can modify those Jinja templates. So if you go to um, let's see, so if you go to the LinkML proper repository and you you copy over your your documentation, um, it might be easier if I just share it really quick. But um, if you go to LinkML, okay, yeah. Yeah, let me let me do that. Um, All right, so you should be seeing the endless the endless repeat there. So, um, all right, uh, let's see what are you seeing? Apologies, you should be seeing LinkML, LinkML. In in our package repository, there are um, uh, there are templates generators. Doc Gen. There are these templates. And so this is kind of giving you an, an uh, insight into how we're actually generating that documentation. There are a series of, of, of markdown templates written in Jinja that tell you, go query the model that I've just given you and throw up uh, the details of that model on, an, on, an, on a markdown page. So in this one, this is the, the class Jinja template. And it's saying, go get the title from 
the schema element and does it use URIs? If it does, then, then you know, do some work here to make the URI the most important part. You know, if, if it doesn't show something else, you know, in this section, maybe down here, it's generating a schema diagram. So if I look at uh, BioLink model, which is one that I'm really familiar with, you can see that that Jinja template translates directly into what's produced here. So it's grabbing the title and it's displaying it with this kind of, you know, wrapper, and then it's using the description from the model and it's generating these nice diagrams. And in fact, I can sort of click on these diagrams and get to another, another section of my model. And you can customize those. So you can say, well, I don't want to see this inheritance thing because my model is pretty to that Jinja template and remove it, right? None of that stuff is necessary. You can just use the defaults and it's it works just fine. But um, we just wanted to say that there's there's a possibility for you to, to customize this. Some of the nice places to customize it that people have have found are, you know, deciding which, let's just look this a little bit bigger, deciding which kind of schema diagram that you want to use, for example. So this one is generating a kind of UML using mermaid uh, uh, templates. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it's completely the best UML you've ever seen, but for people that aren't familiar with UML, for example, it does, get, it does give them a relationship between classes. We have another generator contributed by one of our uh, open source developers, Plant UML. It's another UML diagramming tool that does a little bit more to show you the um, cardinality between classes and you know uses a little bit more rigorous uh, UML syntax, diamonds and, and closed arrows and things. So you can kind of customize that. You can also look at this in an ER diagram kind of way. So if you wanted to use the, the, the generator to make um, SQL-like uh, diagrams, you could do that as well. So there's lots of ways to customize these things, but out of the box, you know, you get a lot for free. So this BioLink mostly uses stuff out of the box. Most of this stuff is for free. There are a few things that we've done in, in BioLink, for example, to change that. So we've written a couple of custom, you know, uh, displays here because BioLink is so hierarchical. It has such a deep nesting. We have kind of a simple viewer that lets you kind of see how different classes are related, for example. Or, you know, we might want to focus in our, our application on a particular instance of the model. And so it's showing you in a more specific way how to view that, that hierarchy. So you can make customizations. Um, I think the best way to go in and look at that is just to look at some of these slides and run some of these um, these commands like make doc test. I think Kevin just you just you just ran that, didn't you? Um, <clears throat> so it, it it comes up with a documentation site on your local system, and you can kind of fuss with it depending on your comfort with with UML. <clears throat> right. So I think I talked about that. I don't know, Kevin. Do you want to walk through how we deploy to GitHub Pages? It should almost all the way be done for you. I, I don't know if I have mine checked out as like it's only. Uh, okay, we can show, here's another thing we can do. We can show um, in, uh, in fact, while we've been, um, while we've been talking here, so our project has actually been running its actions, its GitHub actions that we talked about, and then so I was pages for us. And so if you look, you can see that it created a site. I actually can hear a lot of background noise, Kevin. Um, it, it created this site. It deployed this up. This is what Kevin was showing. And it actually deployed the documentation with, hopefully, the default mermaid diagram. So you can kind of see that, you know, without us doing anything, it kind of showed what we just modeled. You can look at different slots. You can look at different classes. You know, you can look at the mappings that we created. So it's saying, you know, for this particular class, we're going to link it directly to itself. It shows you the, the source, the actual YAML that we produced. And then if, you know, if we want to flatten out the hierarchy, it's going to show you which of those slots came from our sample parent class and which came from, um, you know, the class itself. So we would see, um, 
depth being uh, soil sample specific and the rest of these coming from that, that, that upper level class. So I think, honestly, that's all we wanted to show you. If you wanna run, um, if you wanna look at your particular GitHub repository and look for the actions there, if you set the GitHub pages correctly, you should also already have at least what you've developed so far in terms of documentation deployed for you because it's gonna run on every push to your, to your repository. And I think this gotcha is just what Patrick talked about earlier. You need to definitely, you know, configure GitHub to use the GitHub pages branch to display your doc. Uh, da, 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 da. Again, you can check out step three documentation. That's going to have all of the stuff we talked about, plus some customizations to those Jinja templates. You can check those out. Um, and now maybe without <laughs> the hard documentation part, Kevin, maybe you can do code generation. And uh, hopefully, let's see if I've got my audio a little bit better filtered with this headset. Um, let me share again. Okay. All right. Um, let me catch up. Okay. So um, there are. Uh, no, I do not want that one deal. Um, uh the the this this slide describes the the way that um uh the alliance of genome resources is using link ml to define a schema that is a um a data import schema and so there's many members who are have to support their data in the same format and so so link ml is um providing that um uh that uh, constraint upon them. And um, NMDC uses it in this way. Uh, the project I work on, I, I edited a slide that Sierra started and it turned into a little bit of chaos, but um, we use two different link ML schemas and really and in two different roles. And the, um, we use the BioLink model uh, for our data ingest. And essentially that's, there's um, sources, that are in the wild that are their own individual TSV or JSON formats. And we need to convert all that all that data into a LinkML model. And so we're using Pydantic classes there so that everything passes through a, the Pydantic class generated by the BioLink model. And that that um, has the effect of validating each row as it's sort of produced. And those go into a solar, a solar index. Um, but separately, we have the, the problem that we want to describe um, a, uh, um, we want to create a data model for our application as well. And that's sort of what this second schema is. And it, it sort of refers back to BioLink model for the kinds of nodes and edges that are in the graph, but then it's got to, it's got to represent things just like the a request bundle or you know the the that the or a, a bundle of parameters and then the response format for that and so that's used the pydantic is used um to in the fast api and gets sent out of the api and then in the user interface we also use generated typescript classes to um to uh work with those models. Um, and uh, so, so as, a, as a sort of like general assignment, um, this, is, this is what happens in the BioLink model. You may want to sort of produce your Python classes and publish them up to PyPI and so that they can be sort of shared with the world. Um, uh, I kind of wanted to pop over and demonstrate sort of from the point of view of working with like ML model with the goal of generating code. Um, it should be working. Like it, it should be working. Uh, so schema, make sure, make sure I'm back in my default state. How's my background audio? Is much better. Yeah, it's fine. And the awkward situation that if I use my AirPods, I have noise canceling and I don't hear the background noise, but you guys do. And then this way, 
Um, I have no noise canceling, so I hear all the background noise, but you don't. And <laughs> so it's uh, all right. Um, I wanted my root sample collection has slot samples, and I want to I want to mess with that slot samples to demonstrate um, changes. So slots samples is currently is inlined true. And so if I um, right now in my make file, I have along with gen project and the configuration of gen project. Um, uh, I'll say that we uh, the obvious thing to do would be to add type Pygetic and TypeScript here, but they're not supported in in Gen Project yet, and so that's like a bug. We, that's sort of a bug we need to work out. Um, and so the sort of fallback is to put them in the make file, um, and that's done here, passing sort of an argument and producing these two. So if I make Gen Project, it will produce those two files. Which are do I have to open? there's my there's my pedantic model of this schema and lots of imports at the top. There's some fair amount of complexity. There's this sort of pedantic configuration stanza, uh, and then you get into your enumerations and your classes, um, and so you can see sort of the definition of your biome. Enumeration. Here is the sample collection tree root class that is your sort of uh, right now is a dictionary mapping IDs to um, to one of the three. So since they all extend, it makes this union of what's what's being extended. Um, all the all the types of samples, or I guess the two types of samples and the root class are all valid in that union. And then here it's it's uh, producing um, each of the field types. It's using enumerations, and then one oh, nice little extra is it is producing this pattern ID function that is uh, doing a, a regex check against the um, the the prefix value there, and that comes directly from from this slot usage ID pattern air sample right there. So that's sort of it's a really nice situation case of a, of the a model constraint going directly into the code. Um, the thing I wanted to to kind of touch on is the mapping between um, how you get a list, how you get a dictionary, how you get a string, like just the whether you have just the ID or whether you have the whole object. And the the main the property that uh, composes that is uh, oh yeah, it's the slot definition that I want to go to. And the slot definition of samples, the samples collection. So if I say, so right now we had a dictionary mapping from the ID type string to the to an object. If I say inline false and then regenerate my project, then my sample collection is now, it's not a sample object anymore. It's just a list of strings. So it's, it's still multi-valued. <laughs> And it's um, uh, it's not inlined, and so it's not a whole object. So that's that's sort of when you're when you're in dealing with your data model and you want to have just the list of IDs, uh, that's how you you'd sort of represent it in the model, and that's how that's sort of the code that would be produced. Um, and then separately, if I do want to have the whole object, but I I want them stored as a list, not an ID pointing to the to the class you know for lookup and that's really like it's really very dependent on what your code is doing whether you want a list or a, a dictionary you do inline as lists 
true. Generate and then now the it's a list that's a union of the class types. And uh, I can pop over to the TypeScript model too, <laughs> which uh, is, as you can see, like this is the, the whole thing. This is just um, TypeScript interfaces. It is, it's less full featured than, than Pydantic. Pydantic is, um, does, does quite a bit more and sort of further along. Um, but you still have your enumerations and there that's the sample collection is defining it it in this case it's using inheritance um, of the language so it's not specifying all three separately um, but it's producing that and then i and i guess i should um, just in that sort of set of comparisons um, it's probably worth looking at the uh, the python also um, and this is what we're moving away from. We're sort of moving towards Pydantic, but the, it is also the most most sort of full featured um, uh, in that it sort of it it keeps track of the the um, queries of the class and the URI, and this is sort of uh, does quite a bit in that respect. And it it does a bit more magic, um, I think, in data parsing. Um, let's see. Uh, and so I guess we did have this. You can also, you can put things into the into the project. You can also um, run these things uh, directly. And so I'll just copy and paste a chunk of this command. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pipe it to, to less instead, but you can, so, so this is, uh, poetry run is kind of the Simon says that just puts you in your virtual environment and then Gen Pydantix names the scripts and then this is the path to the model. If we go to less, um, this will just sort of print the print that. And I think um, I had TypeScript in there too, but it's the I shouldn't be improvising this. Jason schema dash Jason dot schema dash schema. I think is, yeah. I was going to do SQL DDL, but I I don't remember the the uh, the command off the top of my head. But there's the the Jason schema output directly. Um, is Gen Link ML the one that will sort of read your Link ML schema and then? Yeah. Well, It'll, it'll like make all the imports work correctly and you can generate like a YAML file that is the, the prettified version. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, if I if I just look in, if I peek into my virtual environment, I can, I can, that's a way to, um, to get sort of a look at all of the the generators. So is it a gen link ML? Um, yeah. um, my it's Jen Lincoln uh, producing producing Jason rather than YAML. But uh, but yeah, so so that's that's using generators directly and sort of the connection um, to the the uh, uh, okay. And we went we went through this a little bit. Gen project is sort of where you choose which generators you want or config.yaml is where you sort of can set up uh, your gen project. Uh, yes. um, I think it's, I have a particular question. Okay. Um, 
There we go. There's the owl, so you can get your schema to an ontology browser. Um, and uh, if you do the, the tutorial checkouts, I can just mention that uh, you, if you, you can throw some curly braces on this or, or just um, comment out the, the generator args if you don't have any, any args to pass in. <laughs> Um, um, and then de deployment uh, to to PyPI. I'm I have not done through the cookie cutter myself, um, but I can look at these GitHub actions with you and. Um, See that it's it's already nicely set up for dyna dynamic versioning, and it will build, and it will just um, do the publish action. And so the extra steps are the um, configuration on the Pi PI side uh, to set up your sort of authentication and how to how to set up that publishing. All right, and now I can I can pass back to Patrick for. <laughs> I think we have a, I think on the schedule, we have a, a quick 10 minute break. Um, so, um, yeah. Just, I, just before we do that, like, thank you, Kevin. I, Kevin's family, unfortunately, has been sick for the last week or so. And so he's kind of like trying to do this on the fly. And so I appreciate it, Kevin. And, you know, if he did get lost along that way, it's, it's not Kevin's fault. It's the terrible Eugene sickness that's going around where we live. And um, you can definitely follow along with the checkout. Um, and if there's questions, of course, we can answer them. And now a break. And now a break. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, break. If there's questions, feel free to throw them out. Otherwise, I think we'll start again at uh, quarter till. Maybe, maybe, maybe a, quick, a quick question. So, like, uh, I, I was trying to follow along, and, and, and but like, I'm, I'm, I'm still not exactly sure what we've accomplished here. <laughs> Sorry. I have a question along the same lines, I, and maybe it's even more naive. So, <clears throat> when you run something and it's generate Python, generating Python code, I don't really know what that code would do for one thing, and the second thing is I don't know what PyPI is. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, those are those are great questions. Yeah, so so PyPI is like a package repository where if you're developing in Python, you can go and grab the package that someone else has written and use it in your code. And so in LinkML, like you might have a use case where you're trying to write an application on top of a model, and you want the classes in your you know application to match exactly what your subject matter expert said in the model. And so what LinkML does is it takes that YAML file and it runs through code generation to make the Python classes that you're going to use in that model. And so what we're trying to demonstrate is that it's sort of push button. So from the command line, for example, in your LinkML project you just built, you can run gen pydantic, which is the command line tool for making a pydantic class out of your model, and it will generate Python for you. Once you have that Python, you can stick it up in PyP and someone else from outside your project can come along and say, you know, import Sierra's project dot whatever, and it will pull in that class. And now suddenly my Sierra's project is being used in a different application. And so um, that can be extremely helpful uh, in the use cases that Kevin showed where, you know, you might have Kevin uses the model I generate to make a website, the monarchinitiative.org, right? He's using the same classes that we've defined from a subject matter level expertise to make a website that shows the relationship between phenotypes and disease and genes and phenotypes. Okay, and so it's a fairly naive user. When I when you say class, should I think predefined data structures? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. That's a great that's a great way to say it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um I decided that the hundred degree heat was favorable to the noise. Um that the uh uh the way you think of it is yeah you sort of reason the class in, in to be able to sort of make uh, pass each of your instances through, you know, a sort of validation step. And it's not the same as the validator, um, but you sort of, it's sort of, um, it can be nice to get that sort of one at a time effect 
um, of passing it, passing it through the classes. I think, and and that's a reason why um, sort of my like unfamiliar unfamiliarity with Gen Project is that um, the biolink model is sort of where the Gen Project happens for me, and then I just get to do a Python import, and I sort of pick my version, and um, and then I'm not generating the Pydantic locally in my project, like sort of happening upstream. Thanks. Another tiny question. Uh, so like, I, I see in the schedule we'll have about thirty minutes at the end to talk about like uh, our own use cases and what uh, what should be done. Okay, I'm looking forward to this thing <laughs> because you gave the the Monarch uh, initiative example and I uh, like it. They've been working on Fino packets and things, and we do stuff in Fino packets. So like, uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. No, that would be great. It would be great to get your guys' feedback and to really do some use cases that are important to you. Um, because I think that the tooling is there. It just depends on what you want to use it for. Yeah. Um, That's good. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll say again, too, that like there are sort of levels of, of detail that you need here. And it depends on your level of expertise, right? So when you're using the cookie cutter like we did at the beginning, you get a lot of this stuff for free and you can just ignore it, right? But if you want to get into customizing your outputs for your use cases, that's when some of these tools that are in the slides become handy. So right, by default, we don't generate pedantic classes from LinkML. If you use the tutorial, what you're gonna get is Python data classes, right? You have a fast API implementation, right? You're making an API that uses your model. You really want that pedantic model so that it just seamlessly folds into your code base. That's where you start using things like gen project or that config file that we showed. Same with the linter, right? If you want to get more functionality out of the toolkit, you can customize it. But out of the box, really, you're going to get a lot of the way there in terms of sharing your model with your entire staff or with other people from just writing in the YAML itself. Um, and I think the other thing that we tried to show in those slides was that like, it depends on your use case what serializations you actually need. If I want to throw up BioLink model to something where biologists know where to find it, ontology lookup service, I'm going to serialize BioLink model as OWL. It has a direct path into ontology lookup service. If, you know, something like the Alliance of Genome Resources, where they're really concerned about ingesting data uh, according to a schema without doing a lot of data wrangling on top of that data, they want to have a really good contract between the person who's submitting data to that resource and their schema. So they're going to make JSON schema out of their LinkML model. And they're going to stick that JSON schema right in the middle Anything that comes into that JSON schema has to be validated, which Patrick is going to get to in just a second here, with the JSON schema representation of their LinkML model. And then on their other side, they're going to have a SQL database. And that SQL database's data definition language is going to be conformant to this LinkML model, right? And so they can switch out backends. They can say, you know what, I don't like SQL anymore. I want to use Neo4j. I don't have to rewrite my entire schema. I already have it in LinkML. LinkML can produce you know, nodes and edges, just like it can produce tables and columns. So it really decouples the technology from your, you know, your meta model, for lack of a better word. Monarch might do it the, on the up, opposite side. They're not so concerned about people submitting data to their system in a rigorous way because they're doing that all themselves. They're an aggregator. They're pulling it in. They're writing the definition for, you know, bringing in this data. But on the other side, they want, you know, their downstream developers to develop according to this subject matter expertise. And so they might generate the TypeScript model in you know, JavaScript or whatever to, to show to the user. So um, the whole point of that gen project, gen LinkML, gen this, gen that, is to be able to fit into a existing technical stack without changing the, the definitions of your classes and slots. <clears throat> the easiest way to see that is in the documentation, or the easiest way to see that in the, co the concept of that is in the documentation, because it's kind of already deploying for you. It's kind of already showing up on GitHub. It is changing from YAML into Markdown, so you can see that there's like kind of some code going on in the background to make those Markdown files for you. But you know, you kind of have to customize it to your use case. <clears throat> I find it interesting what you just like it. within the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. There's a lot of discussions right now as to like how to model schemas, and there's even a work a study group looking at what would be the recommended way to publish your own schemas. And, uh, you know, so there's the, uh, 
there's a pheno packet uh, uh, which is originally provided as protoboth uh, object, and then many people don't use Java and they don't do protoboth, and then, then they start working on their on, on their JSON schema, and then and then, and then you, you need shims between like, and, and this is a hot topic right now. Like, what do we require? people to express their, their their schemas as to make it uh, like intercap compatible at least between work stream within global alliance and those things so like yeah absolutely that's exactly i mean it it's so common right you, if you're talking about a use case where you know you want to switch out the back end because somehow you know neo4j is no longer performant and so you want to put sql in there or something or or, or vice versa and the 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 technical cost of that is so great or the code you have to write to be able to convert between some of these technical implementations is so great that you just stop and so you have an outdated model right that might not be applicable to the more recent developers that you've hired um, because you're stuck in protobuf or you're stuck in sql or you're stuck here you want to be able to take all that knowledge that you made to make the really the 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 language you're using to talk amongst the layers of your project you want to keep that domain model but just be able to put it in a different technology. And so that's sort of what LinkML is trying to do. Um, there's of course other tools like this out in the world. Ours is sort of like written in the biological space to begin with. So we know how important like ontologies are and OWL is in the semantic web and all of that stuff. So I feel like that's where LinkML tries to sit, exactly those use cases. And you know, there's nothing, there's nothing preventing you from writing your entire LinkML model in JSON schema. We kind of briefly touched this in the beginning that there are tools in LinkML like Schema Automator that takes a JSON schema. And I think I did this for GA4GH once um, in your uh, VRL. I, th I think that's the name of it. There's, there's a sub schema that you have. And I, I took the JSON schema, I ran it through Schema Automator and it spat out LinkML YAML, right? So that me as a LinkML developer, I can see where your JSON schema is going in my own frame of reference. But you don't necessarily have to like teach everyone who's just learned JSON schema how to do LinkML YAML. You as a technologist can do that conversion for them, keep it in YAML, maybe then translate it into OWL or wherever else you want to go with it too. So <clears throat> that's a, it's a nice feature. Did we, did we suck up all the break, Patrick? Should we, should we move on here or do we do what does people actually want to get a glass of coffee or go to the bathroom? Yeah, we can, I, the, this validation part shouldn't take too long, so um, we can just probably continue on if I can figure out where my slides went. <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, sharing screen. Here we go. Okay, so this is our last like formal section here, um, validating data. So. <clears throat> The um, sort of the motivating like scenario here is like continuing on with our like original uh, samples schema. Let's say like a soil researcher has produced data that they want to submit to us. And so what we want to do is verify that their data conforms to our schema before we accept that, whatever that means. Accepting means we put it in a database, accepting means, you know, whatever. We just, so um, we'll keep that intentionally vague. And, <laughs> um, but um, just starting with like the most basic, like way you could do this is um, using the LinkML validate command line tool. Um, so this is a, it's, it's a configurable like utility um for validating data instances against a schema and so kind of at a bare minimum you you tell this command here's you know here's the schema file that you, you know the, uh, that defines like the classes i want to uh, validate against and then some source of data which is usually going to be um, a file um, in various formats um, there's a link to the documentation here, but um, we'll just do a, a quick uh, example. So let's imagine that um, somebody's provided a single instance 
of the soil sample class in a YAML file. Um, so I'm going to, no, there it is. Um, Um, I'm going to make a new file called soil sample.yaml. I'm just going to stick it in this um, source data examples directory. Um, and here's the content. Um, so ID, latitude, longitude, this should look all look familiar based on like the schema that we've written. Um, and so with that, I can run this command. So link ML validate, um, the schema pointing to that, to our YAML file. The target class, I'm telling it there's a number of classes in our schema, and I'm telling it I want you, you should interpret this data as an instance of the soil sample class. And then I'm giving it a path to, um, to this file. And if I run that, hey, no, no issues found. So that's. Yeah, Patrick, I think, I think you're sharing your screen right now. We, we, we see the slide. But, uh... Are you seeing the slide or are you seeing? I see your IDE. Oh. Nope. Right, maybe David can uh, try refreshing. Okay. Yeah, you might have to refresh. Sorry about that. OK. Um, OK. So so this is good. So it told us that this is a, what, what should be considered to be a valid soil sample. So that's, that's nice. Um, now, if we wanted to. Um, we could try updating this sample. It's because we want to see this thing like catch up problem. So the sample biome slot in our uh, schema, if I find it here, sample biome, the range of this um, slot is this biome type enum. And this biotype enum permits certain values. And so if I were to change um, sample type biome from desert to say my backyard, uh, it should tell me about this because backyard is not one of these permissible values. So let's let's see what happens in this case. So I'm, I've updated my I've updated my uh, example data and I run this again. And you can see uh, it's saying there's an issue. Um, and so just kind of breaking this down a little bit, um, error is so we have kind of some kind of, some kind of uh, indication of uh, severity here. The, this could be an error, a warning, a, um, uh, just sort of informational, um, depending, on, depending on the details. Um, and uh, the next part is kind of telling you where this data instance came from. So there's a that this is the, the path to the, the example file we gave it. I'll talk about this slash zero in just a second. Um, the last part of this where it says in slash sample biome is giving an indication of where within the data instance um, the problem is. So in the basically in the in the sample biome um, slot or the field, however you want to refer to it. And then um, uh, and then this last part is um, the details on, on, on the exact issue. And it's telling you pretty clearly in this case that backyard is not one of the um, permissible values. Uh, I think I've got this, yeah, listed out on the slides here. So again, severity where the thing came from, a pointer to within the instance to where the problem is, and then a detailed description of the problem. Um, OK, let's expand uh, on the, our example. So um, the link ML validate um, 
command knows how to handle multiple instances in one file. Um, if you're using a YAML format, you could you could separate these two instances as um, what's called multiple documents within a YAML file, separated by this um, triple triple dash thing. So let's try that out. Um, Okay, so now I've got I've got two instances of soil sample that I want to want to validate, um, and I'm going to change this back to uh, I think it was desert before. Okay, so we'll get rid of that issue. Um, I'll run this again, and it's going to tell me that there were no issues found. Uh, now, if you were yeah okay right I ran this command no issues found. Although if you were really uh, looking at this closely, you would, this maybe would have caught your eye. <laughs> this is a latitude that is like, I don't know, off the planet somewhere. So latitude should be between negative 90 and 90, and we gave it 123. And so that's, that's perhaps a problem. So that kind of indicates like um, a deficiency in our, in our model. Um, we didn't, we didn't, specify in our model that, you know, that latitude needs to be between negative 90 and 90. Um, so this is the definition of our latitude slot as it exists right now. And, um, you know, if you if you kind of poke through the link ML modeling documentation a little bit, you might find that there are meta model constructs, minimum value and maximum value. So we could use those to our advantage here. Um, let's go back over to our IDE and add those. So we'll locate our latitude slot and we'll say minimum value, negative 90, oops, maximum value, And now if I run the link ML validate command again, I'm hoping it catches that error that I would have expected. And indeed it does. Um, so it says, so yeah, there's an error in this file. And now maybe this slash one makes more sense. This is the sort of the index to within the file. So this is the, this, this example or this, um, instance would be the sort of the zero index one. This would be the, the index one in that instance. Um, uh, and so the, the problems with the, 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 the first <laughs> zero based uh, soil sample here. And it's telling me that, you know, this is greater than the maximum of uh, 90 in the latitude slot. So yeah, so this is this is narrowing it down for me pretty well, uh, you know, what the problem with, uh, with this data is. Um, and so that this is kind of, um, you know, so you could see this as a, as a, as a, as an aid to schema development, if you wanted to. So there's, there's one sort of use case of, of link ML validate where you, you know, you're saying some, somebody from the outside world is, is giving me data and I want to see if that data conforms to my schema and I can give them a yes or no answer on that. And, but also like maybe I'm coming up with sort of artificial examples just to exercise my schema and see if it's, if it's um, um, validating things that I would, you know, doubt validating data in the way I would expect it to. Um, the way we found out that we were missing minimum value, maximum value here. So, um, yeah, so some people sometimes think of validation as a, as an aid for schema development. And so there's another command line utility that kind of formalizes this a little bit, if you will. Um, and, uh, and that's this, uh, link ML run examples command. And so what the gist of what this is, what this command expects is, is, is for you to point it to a directory of examples that you expect to validate correctly according to your schema and then point it to sort of a, a directory of counter examples that you say, I expect these to not pass validation. 
Um, and so that can be, you know, if you have a testing process for your schema, this can be hooked into the testing process. And it's just a way to make sure that your, um, your schema doesn't, you know, uh, drift away from like these uh, important use cases that you've defined via example files. So what I could do is say in my examples directory, I actually split out that one file into two separate files and put them into an invalid directory, you know, so I can put that, that soil sample with the latitude that's too high, put that in, in one file under this invalid directory. I could keep the original correct soil sample in the, in this valid directory. And then this, this command is, is rather lengthy, <laughs> but you know, link them out, run examples, tell it the invalid, uh, invalid directory is the, the counter example input directory. Uh, the valid directory is the input directory. It's going to produce a bunch of output, so I need to tell it where to put that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm not going to go through all that right now because just be shuffling files around. Um, and uh, I will also point out that there's a, a, a target called test examples in the in the make file that kind of is a little bit of a shortcut for running that command. Um, so yeah, so some people like that, that, that model. And then, you know, we're not going to go through that in this, in this, um, workshop, but, um, you know, if you want to go further with validation, you can access the same kind of, um, underlying features that the link ML validate command line utility uses. You can use that in Python code. If that is, you know, if that works for your, your particular project, you know, maybe you have um, a bunch of Python code already written and you want to sort of integrate um, a link ML validation step into that Python code, you can, you can do that. Um, and then the, if you want to stick with the CLI, you know, and configure it to, to use different validation strategies, et cetera, there's, there's a whole host of configuration you can do. Um, that we can't get into here, but you know, if you take a look at this um, uh, documentation page, this this walks through uh, sort of using using this in, in Python code. Um, uh, talks about more advanced features of the command line interface, um, and I think yeah, I think that's it. So. Um, I think we're just basically at the at the, the kind of end where we can kind of just do a little free form discussion and, and and that sort of thing. So I will I'll stop sharing. Maybe. Yeah, okay, there we go. That was great. I think validation is actually really helpful for supporting the the use case where you, you want Lincoln to be sort of like a or your data model in general, even if you don't want to do Lincoln out. You want it to be sort of a substrate for collaboration. Oftentimes, you have people with different skill levels there. So, if you're trying to, trying to train an entire co component of your project to use use a schema language, you want to have those example data in there so that you can see, as a subject matter expert, software developer, what I'm actually talking about when I say something is required. Like, it's not un it's not unexpected to have people of many different skill levels uh, trying to contribute to that model. So. Um, we try to do examples forward design uh, of our schemas. Okay, that's a lot of us talking. So how can we <laughs> how can we help? Um, what can we go into deeper? Is it acceptable to request a five minutes break now? <laughs> Absolutely, we can take a five minute break. Absolutely, let's come back at two ten. That was that's six minutes. <laughs> All right, two ten. So, so again, we, we kind of have a large community of open source developers. We do have monthly meetings. Those are perfect opportunities to come and, you know, ask questions, get direct access to the developers of this toolkit, present your work, you know, that question that we had at the beginning about what other models are using LinkML, am I working in the same domain as someone else? It's a great place to do it. If you click on this link, you can join our Slack space. Again, 
offline connection with developers, other people in the community. And, you know, there's plenty of ways to connect. So just get in touch, uh, mailing list, Mastodon, link, LinkedIn, I, we've got it covered. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, you might run into Nomi Harris, who's the coordinator for Bosque. She's also on our team and she's a great community, community uh, manager. So, so say hi if you see her at the conference next week or in a couple of weeks. And then please fill out this survey. It's linked in the doc or in the slides. I'll also put it in the chat. I think that's for ISMB. Um, and we'd appreciate your feedback, of course. And then I'll just stop talking. And are there questions or things that we can go into further that would help? If not, that's totally okay. We can end a little early. <laughs> yeah, I know that like there's there's just so many things that like uh, in the ecosystem that we could talk about. And so it's like kind of a, a challenge <laughs> challenge for us to to balance like just giving a like a little taste of everything versus like going to deep into into certain things. And so um yeah, I mean, yeah. If if you have questions, if you if you want to try to get started using LinkML tools, and you're just like still a little unsure of like where to get started, like this is a great great time to ask that kind of thing. Well, one thing you mentioned early on, or not early on, but about halfway through, you made an example, Sierra. Of you said, "Oh, you could take an abstract and turn that into a schema," and I didn't. I was like, "Oh, I don't even. I'm not sure I know what that means." <laughs> But I can tell you, um, like, I'm here because link ML sounds like a systematic way to describe data and then link it to many, many things. Um, I come at this as a biologist who likes to compute things. And I've been doing genomics for like 25 years now. And I've always been surrounded by data. And I've always been wanting to describe it as systematically as possible. And I run into Chris at various conferences and, you know, ontology stuff from 20 years ago. Um, and all the stuff that tends to come at me is really, really obtuse and obscure. <clears throat> um, and I'm trying to make it real for biologists, right? And so, um, but over the years, I have analyzed hundreds, if not thousands of projects. <clears throat> and I systematically describe to my own satisfaction with YAML quite often, the work that I do. Um, so I have data sets that I can describe. I have the reports and the, the analysis that I do about them that's systematic. And then how they connect to other things. And so I think link ML can probably be used to like make connections between all those things if they were all just described properly. Anyway, that's, that's that. but that's then you mentioned abstracts as schemas and I was like, ooh, that's interesting too. <laughs> that's fantastic. I feel like you're exactly the demographic that we were hoping would have come to this tutorial because there is a lot of subject matter expertise that's in the lead with lots of technology overload. And I think that maybe we did a little technology overload in this one too. But, um, you know, you, lessons learned. But I think that, like, if you're a subject matter expert and you already can write YAML, LinkML is a great way for you to contribute your expertise to a computable standard that someone with more technical skills or yourself can just take and then apply in different ways to different applications. And so, you know, what we've found is that oftentimes so I work on, you know, the Alliance of Genome Resource, National Microbiome Data Collaborative, BioLink, and Catch Translator. What we find is that there's there's a role for someone who is a LinkML expert to come in and say, these are the classes and slots. This is how you do it. And in about two or three of these tutorials, a subject matter expert can say, oh, I get it. And then they take it up. They write complex descriptions. They write complex interrelationships between those classes and slots. They understand more deeply than I do how to apply an ontology to their data. And so it's almost like we can turn over the keys to the people that actually understand data from, you know, collecting it. And we can sit back and say, and you've produced us something that I can compute. I don't have to ask you again about this spreadsheet header. <laughs> like I don't have to ask you again. And you don't have to be annoyed with me for not understanding what you mean. Because you've written in the description, you've given me metadata on my data. So um, I'm glad you spoke up because I, you know, I'm glad that someone said this is this is actually something that's on your radar. Because um, yeah, it can be hard to know, you know, how to convey that message to people. 
Great, great. Um, I think I think an interesting uh, development of LinkML two has been that uh, the semantic web community in Europe has really grabbed on to this technology. And it, so we had a, a presenter at our community meeting last month from like as a, a representative representative of electric grid operators from the UK and from Belgium coming together on a data standard to represent grid operations in LinkML, right? So we kind of, we are from a biological background, but LinkML is very generic language. So just like JSON schema, you can apply it to a lot of different stacks. The relevance here for this conversation is that, you know, biology is complex. You might just be focusing on this very tiny slice of biology, but if it's in LinkML, you can connect it to BioLink, which has, you know, maybe your clinical components, or you can connect it to natural microbiome data collaborative. And suddenly you have a microbiome sample from a human gut that can be related to the microbiome sample from, you know, I don't know, the soil which with where it was collected. So yeah. um, can I ask, um, yeah. do you see the the LinkML standard like the the, the YAML format ever being a sort of a target as a data model, or do you always see it as something that's going to be transpiled into RDF, uh, Pydantic? Like, do you always see yourself as this authorship format for other things? Mm, or would question. you like it to yeah. be a standard all the time? I mean, I, I guess I can start maybe, <laughs> and uh, Sierra, maybe you can correct me where I'm wrong. But I, I think that the the original vision of LinkML was as a bit of a like um, a Swiss Army knife, sort of like in in that in that like you know it, it's it's kind of the central source of truth, but then a lot of the quote unquote real work gets happens using artifact, and you we sort of like leverage existing technologies by being sort of a Mm, you know, uh, a more abstract sort of uh, definition language or definition layer. So that that really was kind of the original vision. And increasingly, I think, especially even in the um, <clears throat> validation realm, we're starting to see the limitations of that because under the hood, not that this is like, you know, matters for most people in day-to-day -day usage, but under the hood, LinkML Validate is, is highly leveraging JSON schema validation. So you could kind of think of it as just like a, a wrapper around, take my schema, generate JSON schema from it, apply that JSON schema to whatever data is, is coming in. It's not, it's not exactly that simple, but like you could imagine it that way we are kind of seeing in certain projects that have very complex link ml schemas we're kind of starting to see the drawbacks of that approach right the approach of you know just generate some existing standard and, and utilize existing tools it gets you pretty far pretty fast which is nice because you're leveraging a lot of other people's great work um, but there are limitations, and so we're starting to see that. And so we are kind of thinking about implementing a LinkML like native uh, validation tool, where there's sort of no transpiling going on, no generating other artifacts. It's just operating on the LinkML schema. Um, it's working on that, like in with like a focused effort is a little dependent on like, you know, getting people's time and <laughs> a lot of focus, which, check, you know, kind yeah. of equates to money, but like, um, it's definitely something we're, we're, we're thinking about. Okay. One question. Uh, would, you, would you say that like, uh, um, like adopting like make it out to start expressing or can facilitate the semantic web like uh, uh, say we we're starting to publish more uh, more uh, more of that data you know and, and then like we, we we've had like a like a, 
and semantic web and the under our, our radar as important things to watch, but like like we just don't have time to dedicate to 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 to, to do these things. Uh, so like uh, even that you're saying you write well, I think Sarah, you, you were talking about that. Like, you you um, you write your link link ML schema and you have all of these conversion tools to to have your JSON schema and have like your your RDF uh, like documents and, and those things so like a, like this kind of like a an easier entry step into that other world that we haven't that that is exactly our hope <laughs> um Chris Chris yeah, all of you know Chris Mungo like he's clearly uh very fluent in the semantic web and what what he's said to us over time and you know Patrick and Kevin and I have sort of entered into his world right in the last 10 years but it's hard for people who are technologists to necessarily get the skills they need to be proficient in the semantic web it it's just a little bit harder we're not trained for that when we come out of school necessarily and, you know we could talk about forever how that's a problem because we love the semantic web and it, this should be the foundation and come on come on come on but if you ask a bunch of developers do they know sql you know, select statements, or do they know Sparkle? I bet you would say SQL most of the time. And that's not great or bad or whatever. It just is what it is. Do you know JSON schema or do you know YAML? You probably know JSON schema now. So, um, but but we don't want things like ID maintenance and, you know, you know, stable URIs to be lost because those are so critically important to, you know, us being able to reuse data in the biological sciences. So what LinkML tries to do is hide those things in a syntax that is more familiar to object-oriented programmers, in a syntax that's approachable for users that don't necessarily know any technology. YAML, uh, we didn't go into this at all in the tutorial, but we do have tools that take like spreadsheets and turn them into LinkML, right? So we know where our users are. They're in this very like flat table world and we want them to add URIs, we want them to add identifiers, we want them to use semantic web components, we want to reuse ontologies, we want to model in object relational models, right? Like we want to do that, we just need to help people from where they are to where they're going. So I don't think, you know, this is trying to replace RDF, it's not trying to replace JSON schema, it's not trying to replace anything, it's just sort of trying to be a bridge. Um, how, how successful that is, um, I think uh, we have one particular flagship project that is trying very hard to make their source of truth technology RDF, right? So they're trying to work in a graph. They're trying to, you know, use the OWL representation of their LinkML model to do validation and to do exploration. And, you know, I think that's a really good use case. I think more often our other flagships tend to use the ones that the developers, you know, know better, JSON schema, you know, you might use SQL, things like that. So. If you have an RDF use case, we'd love to have you come to the Lincoln Milk Community Meeting. I think in August, Chris is going to do a full hour on the relationship between Lincoln Mel and the semantic web. So I think that'll be a really good place to come and see it um, and you know develop from there. I have a couple more, but I, I want to let, <laughs> let others have a chance to. So. Actually, I have one, one question. So I, I work for a company um, that develops a workflow engine um, and we're sort of for computational workflows. Um, and we're sort of thinking about extending the sort of output schema for these workflows or like the way outputs are defined. Uh, like an interesting use case for this sort of tech would be like obviously annotating those outputs with like, um, if we were to choose a technology for to, to from your expertise, like should RDF as one of the targets for LinkML be what we should be building on in an in its like perfect, perfect case? Or does it not matter? Like, or does it just depend? It might be a complicated answer. Okay. Like we're not, we not like to make it programming language agnostic. Um, but apart from that, um, like, is there, do you have any recommendations on which uh, LinkML target we should be thinking about first? Well, can I ask you a question? Like, who are the primary users of your software stack? Um, bioinformaticians, computational I'm, biologists. Computational biologists. Yeah. I. Mm. So you're going to hear my bias, and maybe Chris would answer this differently. 
But I would say probably REF is not your target. Right, a bioinformatician maybe isn't necessarily trained in RDF as much as they're trained in just Perl or Python, right? Like something a little bit more approachable. Um, but, 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 but I'll but take that with a grain of salt, right? Like I don't, I don't know your user base, and so I guess maybe my answer would be it depends. Where, where is your user base most comfortable? Is it RDF? Then, then of course use it. <laughs> um, so, and maybe I don't know, Patrick, Kevin, do you guys have? different opinions. It could be that I'm just off on a tangent here. No, I think it really just depends on, it depends on so many factors about how your, um, how your project is configured both in like a technical and in a social way. Um, you know, I know some projects where like, <clears throat> it's all like, the schema is really way far in the background and you only sort of rely on like interfaces like web APIs to like, you know, uh, to, to import or export data, in which case, you know, what artifacts you generate from the link and all schema is sort of irrelevant because it's always kind of hidden behind this API layer. So in the, if that's the situation where that you're facing, then it's just kind of like, well, it depends it's just technical. It's just a technical like implementation detail about what artifacts you care to generate from your link ML model versus other types of projects where that's the schema is like right out there, like right front and center and you really publish it and you really try to socialize it with users. And, um, and then, yeah. And then maybe your decision is more based on what those users are familiar with. So, um, it's a it's a really hard question to answer. Um, yeah, I suspected I suspect that might have been uh, <laughs> might have been the case, but um, I wanted to ask it anyway. Uh, it's still it'll give me lots of food for thought. Yeah. You should go, David. <laughs> uh, so, in the uh, example that you you pasted in the chat, uh, Sierra, you. you uh, one is specifically talking about the field packets, like the uh, link, link ML .io slash, you know. so, so, so um, there's an example saying how to index Fino packets with link ML store. So link, link ML store is a, uh, I guess it's a, it's, it's an engine or back with a backend with a relational database backend to just like eat link ML objects. And, uh... Yeah, you, I'm glad you looked for it. Link ML store is another, uh, 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 data project that we're working on. So just the same thing, we're trying to remove the technology choice as a blocker for making a, a domain model. We're also trying to remove the, the choice of technology from being a storage blocker for making your model. So I don't know if I'm describing that correctly, but LinkML store is kind of like a, an interface between you know, solar as a backend or a relational database like DuckDB as a backend or, you know, any, any other number of, of backends that you could choose there. Um, and, you know, I probably wouldn't say I'm an expert in LinkML store. Chris is just developing that now. <laughs> so um, I probably could answer some questions about it, but, but I'm definitely not an expert. I don't, I don't know. Kevin, did you have more experience with LinkML store through solar? I'm not, I'm not using it yet for as long as back. And it's sort of, I think there's some things that, are, that will like need to move around and some like work to do. Um, so I'm, I'm generating um, the two sort of relevant data sources. You know, I'm, I'm making a SQLite and, I, and also actually a DuckDB database. I'm making SQL tables out of my graph, for like node edges. And then also I'm putting all that into solar. And I am using, I'm using a tool called LinkML Solar that um, I think, uh, you know, Chris wrote, in like four hours while he was doing, while he was like, doing, you know, at a meeting or something, I, I don't know, that um, that I'm sort of like maintaining since, that, uh, I think I'm, I, I might be the only user of it. Um, but what it does is takes a link email schema and turns that into a solar schema. And then um, uh, it also has the like functionality to load my TSV file in and make a bunch of solar documents out of it. And I think that repository should go away. And within LinkML, there should be like a gen stoller that will just make the schema document that needs to get sort of uploaded or whatever, or will, you know, 
yeah, I think make this sort of schema JSON that gets pushed up to configure. And then uh, link ML store would be the thing that, um, that then uh, I would use to like bulk upload the, the, the documents or sort of bring them down and sort of query for them in like a standard way. And then I'd be able to sort of like have either back end, have like a database back end or a solar back end or a Neo4j back end. And I should be able to say, get me the node with this gene ID or whatever, and, and from any of them sort of independently. Thank you for that. Uh, I have another one thing to do. Stupid, but like, uh, like, like, so I guess in the end, what I understand is there's no such way, no such thing as saying my data is expressed in link ML, right? Link ML is just we define your schema and, and then it, it generates schemas in whatever language you want. Like, you don't validate your data with link ML, you validate it with, with, with the schema that was generated out of what you said uh, to, uh, to, to link ML to prepare in one format or another. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a fair way to think about it. Yeah. It, 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 validate your model against LinkML schema as a schema. So your, this is a fun thing about LinkML that your, your schema is um, data that follows the LinkML meta model. You know, so you can validate that data against that model, but then downstream of that, you have your data, which is then validated against your schema as a schema. It's something that takes people a long time to wrap their heads around that. <laughs> so, to get I, I hear a lot, uh, like people in the, well, a lot. I mean, I, I've heard a couple of times that people talking about link ML. Like, how about we express? Should we express? Like, I was talking about G4GH. Like, uh, like, should we express this as a, a JSON schema? Should we go like for, with a? Should we express this as link ML? Okay, well, I understand it. There's no such thing. It's just like it. Yeah. Yeah, LinkML just has a meta model that sort of wraps up the kinds of things you want to see in a schema in its own syntax. And then those are converted to JSON schema if you want, or to model or whatever. There are, as we said before, though, there are components of the LinkML meta model that aren't representable in, you know, different kinds of our serializations. Class URI, again, very important for RDF, not so important for SQL. Or if it is, it's just another column right in the in the table definition so you know when you're talking about whether we should author it in link ml or author it in json schema you can author it in link ml and you can still use the tools you already have that work with json schema with the json schema serialization of your link ML model and what you get on top of that is the ability to do more stuff with it than json schema can so if you want to make an owl version of it you can. There, I don't, as, as far as I know, there's no JSON schema to OWL, you know, path. Although now that I say that, I'm sure somebody has written one. <laughs> this sort of problem feels like an inevitable inevitability when these projects where you have, oh, I'd like to express a set of, like a union of all of these features um, and then no single target accepts all those features. And then suddenly it becomes extremely tempting to why don't we just make our thing the standard? <laughs> like, um, I, I feel like it's, it's no getting around that. Like that temptation will always be there. Um, and it's like, it'd be an expression of humility in the project to always think of yourself as the authorship target, but I understand the temptation might be too great. <laughs> totally agree with you. We have this really great slide that we always put up and I didn't put it in this slide deck, but it's that um, XKCD one where it, yeah we have they're standards. Standards. why don't we make another one and it's totally true and it's totally yeah. reasonable and believe me i wrote a lot of sql and a lot of json schema before i found link ml and i can see why especially if you just have something simple and you're already familiar with the technology why do i need to learn link ml and you know the answer my my answer is always i don't know but it's really easy once you learn it and i've applied it many different places and so I feel like I'm, I've been converted. So that's my job is now to convert you. But I, 
Good, good point. There is always another new thing to come along. I, I think when we were starting Link ML, we also ran into a, a project called Schema Salad, which is like, um, if I'm remembering correctly, it's very similar to Link ML, except it's for a workflow management. Maybe you under, maybe you know it better than I do, but it's um, it's documenting a workflow from X to X to Z, you know, through a bunch of steps, and you specify that in YAML, and then you can convert it to this and that. Blah, 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 blah. So very similar. Oh, CWL project, I think. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would just maybe tack on to the question about like Sierra's point about like you know why why another why like another thing you know like why why another thing I think you know I think the the main things we try to emphasize with Link ML is just that it maybe is more approachable for anybody than writing these other things directly right you know writing JSON schema directly or writing, you know whatever so maybe it helps democratize your schema development a little bit you can get more people involved in the process if that's if that's useful to you um and then uh and then perhaps from the technical side you know maybe it helps avoid a bit of like the vendor lock-in effect you know you maybe you start with a sql database now and you know you you, you utilize the link ml's you know ddl generator today and maybe tomorrow you want to use a graph database and you start using the rdf generator tomorrow you know you, you can do that without maybe a tremendous amount of of conversion headache so you know you're not necessarily locked into one thing that's a compelling argument i think Chris, do you have one more or do I have one more? I'll go to the next one. Okay. Um, so I, I, I just want to, to elaborate a little bit more on the uh, the things about G4GH I was mentioning before. So, so like uh, I'm, um, I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting a bit of, a bit of feedback. Uh, one second. Okay. Um, so like I'm, I'm part of a couple of group, uh, Fino Packets is, 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 is being one of them. Uh, Basically, aiming to write a, a schema on how to to uh, to store uh, clinical data on an individual, their bio samples, and those things. Uh, and and so, I have a, a a side group that's also working on what Phenopacket doesn't look at, which which is the, like a storing experiments metadata, like, like a you know like you run a sequencing experiment on on whatever, like a, whether it's a it's a human sample or a little shovel of dirt to do like uh, metagenomics or, or those things. Like uh, anyway, it's, it's an experience on a experiment on a sequencer. Okay, so like um, we're working on right now. We're just working on a checklist. Like what are the relevant properties to capture uh, to uh, properly characterize a, a, a genomic experiment in a broad sense? And then we look into like uh, going. Uh, you know, by by composition building these kinds of modules where like if it's a transcriptomic experiment there's another set a subset of, uh, of properties that are relevant and then uh, so like um but right now we, we said we, we we're like you know half of the discussions were around what should be in that list and the other half were people saying but how do we express it uh, and and then we we decided to 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 shovel that uh to to to, to later and hopefully to another subgroup that will look at this and and, and actually they had, yeah yeah there's this um, this other study group that i mentioned earlier called the uh, damask that that's looking at these considerations uh, right now so so i i, I just I, I just wanted to express like they they will most likely be interested in that group to to, to what, what you guys are doing and i I, I, if you're interested, I could put you in, in touch with the lead of that, that study group, and maybe we could arrange something that uh, well, that, that might help to, to convince a, a couple of people. Uh, so. We would love that opportunity, especially to tailor the presentation to your use case, because quite frankly, there's like a couple of different efforts going on that sound similar to that, just from us, you know, knowing about a lot of projects that use LinkML in terms of modeling an experiment, you know, modeling sometimes we call it a sample, but how 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 a particular thing moves through different analyses and anal analysis pipelines. So that's the second link I posted in the chat, CMDR. 
Um, and then the first link I posted was, you know, Chris's attempt to convert phenopackets to link ML. So both of those things on both sides of the spectrum, we are definitely, you know, assembling experts that, you know, in biology and also trying to make, you know, link ML the substrate with which to talk about those things. So it would be wonderful to be able to meet people and just sort of tailor a presentation around that. Um, yeah. Are you already on our Slack channel, David? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. I should though. <laughs> Or if you don't want to, here, I'll put my email in the chat and uh, you can just email me and I'll pass it on. Um, or if or if you want to reach out to Patrick on, I think, Patrick, you have your email address handy too, if, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat there. <clears throat> and I, we're, all, um, we're also very uh, active on Slack. I mean, the whole LinkML community is very active on Slack and I, that was linked in one of the presentation slides, but yeah, there's a um, the Obo uh, community uh, Slack has um, some LinkML uh, channels. So one that's geared more towards um, just the, the broader community, and one that's more geared towards like developers. Um, so those would be great to join. And then once you're once you're part of that um, Obo community slack you can like private message like hey, either of us that's, that's totally fine um <laughs> just volunteering sierra for for that so um like in, in the in the use case i described like um you know like well, maybe I'll, I'll I'll dive a little bit more in the concepts we're, we're looking at. So, um, I have an experiment, a sequencing experiment, okay, and then there's a set of properties that describe this experiment. You know, there's an instrument, and there's a molecule you're looking at, and there's a like a, th different things, and and then and then I, I'm doing if I'm doing a transcriptomic experiment, there might be an additional set of properties that are relevant to transcriptomic, and then. If I'm doing single cell experiment, then there might be another set of properties about about single cell. So like, like, is, is there, uh, I need to wrap my mind more around, around what we've seen today. And, and, and like, like, is, is there a way to express this in, in, in LinkML, like this kind of composition concept that this is, there's a core and then basically, basically you're gonna, you can kind of choose tags that are relevant to what you're doing. And this, this add things to your, uh, your, uh, your own uh, your own your own case yeah absolutely and there's there's sort of two ways out of the box to do that and one is sort of through this is a method right so i'm trying to find an example that would work here but like if you had a, a gas chromatography experiment and some some more specific gas chromatography experiment was was also required. I don't, I'm not an expert at gas chromatography, but you had some sort of like sub process of that. You could extend the gas chroma, <laughs> why did I pick this example? You could extend that class and add additional attributes based on a more specific kind of gas chromatography, right? That's a simple way to do it. You can just extend a class. The other way to do it, there's a couple more ways. Uh, LinkML has this, has a construct called subset, right? And so in that subset tag, you can say, these are the classes in my bigger model that represent this gas chromatography subset. So I'm saying this subset of my model is, has to do with this kind of an experiment. Or even further to the point, if you look at some of our bigger schemas, um, you, in our example, right, we only have one YAML file here. And it's the YAML file um, that has all of our classes. But what people tend to do is break up that YAML file into several different YAML files. And LinkML knows how to handle several different YAML files. And they either do it by domain or they do it by constructs. So they might say all the classes go in this YAML file, all the enums go in this YAML file. But they also do it by domain. So you could have a YAML file in your big, bigger LinkML model that is like um, experiment, uh, gen genome experiments, PCR, I don't know, something like that. And in another YAML file, you have all of your gas chromatography. And what that modularization means that someone comes along and says, I only want to talk to you about gas chromatography. They look in one place or they import just that YAML file into their model and extend it, right? So 
Um, the, I briefly showed a tool called LinkML Map, where I was kind of trying to make the point that you could take latitude and longitude and turn it into a GPS slot. But the other thing LinkML Map does or is intended to do is take a really big schema, something like BioLink, which covers, you know, like I said, the range from genomics to clinical clinicians. It's huge. And it lets you subset that model into, please just give me, you know, these classes and these slots and their parents. Give me just this slice. So I guess in summary, you have ways to extend a class hierarchy with the ISA construct. You have ways to subset a particular schema, either with that meta model component subset or dividing your model into several different YAML files that are imported together and merged together with LinkML. Or through LinkML map, you have the other end of that spectrum, which is, I already have a model, please subset it for me, and I just want this little slice of it. So all those things are valid use cases. They're probably slightly different than what you're asking, but I think you could get there with some of those common practices. In particular, the is a you know, making a subclass, making a parent class, making, you know, grouping together like components and then adding additional components to a, a child of that liked component class. Does that make sense? Say it sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, I'm, I'm surrounded by <clears throat> multiple kinds of technologies, and so I kind of attend to each one of the other screen with, even though the fab is the end of them have kind of more commonality, I guess, perhaps. I think I think my Juno is stuck at the moment, so I, I had a little hard time hearing that, but maybe Patrick could, could respond. <laughs> I tried to share my screen again. Bad idea. No, I don't think it was just you. I also didn't catch it, okay. unfortunately. Sorry. Oh, can you hear me now at all? Now, yeah. Yeah, I was just saying that I'm surrounded by technologies. You know, so we have single cell experiments, we have sequencing experiments, we have proteomics experiments, we have microscopy experiments, but they're all around projects. And so I work at an institute where we just generate information on mass about all these things. And I'd like to describe each technology systematically, of course, but then link them all together around experiments and experiments are done on samples. So I was kind of assuming that you would have your own YAML file for any given kind of technology, et cetera. Absolutely, that's exactly what I was trying to say. You, you basically summarized it. You can, you can model even the metadata around how you make an experiment. And that's a good communication tool for talking about how your organization works. Yeah, I agree. Any work you're aware of on, on the provenance of the data and the level of it? Uh, well, well, we're really good friends with Matt Brush. <laughs> so uh, he's definitely our expert in provenance. I'd say that um, most of our most of our flagship projects use provenance a little bit differently. I'd say BioLink has done the sort of most that I know of to do model provenance, but I don't think it's at all complete in terms of that. Um, I think a lot of times we're motivated by end use cases, which is the user saying, I wanna know the publication this was in. So that's sort of like where <laughs> provenance kind of goes to die, right? Because there's lots more metadata around provenance than just which pub it's in. Pub is extremely important, the most important, but there's also like, what kind of a resource was this? Is it a curated resource? Did I aggregate this together? Is it moving through some sort of ETL pipeline, right? Am I, am I transforming the data to match a new model? There's a whole bunch of provenance there. And um, I, think, I think there's still work to do. I guess in a in a implementation sense that like you'd be sort of defining your schema and you'd have those prominence fields uh, and then you would want to like exact match your prominence field to some um, prominence ontology that that is going to sort of so that it means you know you can define. Uh, uh, this is like kind of well pitching uh, what we're doing in G4GH as well <laughs> one more time, but like uh, it's kind of a new new topic there, but like we on our Google, our projects knows I've been talking about 
about this for a while, like how publications, but more than that, like uh, what's inside of the data set? Uh, is it about the a, a cohort uh, somewhere in Canada uh, with how many participants uh, kept, uh, which time frame and for what reason and and, and those and, and like uh, like there are we we we've met some, some models that, that describe things a little bit but like they're they're far from being complete and they, they they're it really only scratches the surface and and like yeah basically we're we're looking for a way to express these in a way that that's that's compatible with what others are doing. So I guess we should start working on that thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and check out BioLink. You might find some of that stuff helpful. If not, we should we should improve it. Um, but, BioLink, right, okay, BioLink, I'll, I'll yeah. BioLink. BioLink.github.io. All right, we're getting towards the end here. We have about eight minutes left. Um, I want to give you guys time to respond to the survey just because we we want you to be able to tell us, give us good feedback. Um, are there any other sort of last minute questions that we can answer before we, we call it an afternoon here, evening? Any of you guys uh, will be at ISMB? I'll see you there, David. Yeah. Come by, come by yeah. the secure booth, David. I'll see you there. <laughs> Sounds good. David and I were colleagues at McGill. Excellent. <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll be virtual attendees this year. I was there in Lyon last year, um, but not this year. Not another French ISMB for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, then, then we'll, I guess we'll, we'll continue the conversations uh, virtually. Yep, absolutely. Thank you all for attending. I know it was a small group, and I'm glad we were able to see you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah, so, much. thanks so much. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.